Thank you for being here today to our first ever virtual budget hearing. Tonight, Portland City Council is meeting as the budget committee to hear public comment on the mayor's proposed budget for fiscal year 2020 and 2021. My name is Eileen Park and I'm the director of communications for Mayor Wheeler. I will be your moderator tonight. We had 71 people sign up to provide testimony tonight on a range of topics and we are very eager to hear from them. So I will be brief in my comments. I do want to provide a quick acknowledgement of the unusual circumstances that brings us to where we are today. We all know that the COVID-19 crisis has in many ways turned our lives upside down. And throughout this crisis, the city has worked hard to maintain the continuity of critical services for many of our communities. Adapting to the needed change in operations has not always been easy, natural, or even ideal. And for the city's budget, we not only had to adapt to an unprecedented decline in resource, but we also had to condense what normally takes months of thoughtful development into just a few weeks. And we had to do it all remotely. To keep everyone safe and healthy, we had to cancel our planned in-person outreach events. And to comply with Oregon budget law, we had a very small window within which we were allowed to hold this hearing. Unfortunately, this date also conflicts with many other important community events. So we want everyone to know that the mayor's proposed budget takes significant steps towards solving the anticipated budgetary shortfall. So our agenda for the evening is as follows. Budget Director Jessica Kennard will provide a brief presentation outlining the city's budget, budget process, and how the mayor's proposed budget adapted to the sudden decline. We will then hear the mayor's message on the proposed budget as required by Oregon statute. Then we look forward to spending the majority of the time tonight hearing from you, our community. Due to the need to ensure a streamlined virtual process, testimony appointments were arranged ahead of time. So thank you to the community members who are currently gathered in the virtual meeting to provide comment. We appreciate your time, your participation, and especially your patience tonight. We have extended our meeting time tonight to 9 p.m. to accommodate every single person who applied to comment. And now we understand that there are many more people who would have liked to comment on the budget. Know that you can still make your voice heard by submitting your comment online at portlandoregon.gov slash CBO. All comments will be provided to council. So I will now read our rules of conduct. The city council represents all Portlanders and meets to do the city's business. The presiding officer preserves order and decorum during city council meetings so everyone can feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. To participate in a city council hearing, participants have applied to give testimony online as you just heard me say, and if you did not apply and would like to give testimony to council, remember again, just submit the testimony in writing at portlandoregon.gov slash CBO. When testifying, please state your name for the record. Your address is not necessary. Also declare, if you are a lobbyist, if you are representing an organization, please identify it. You have two minutes to testify. You will be timed by staff, and when your time is almost over, you will be given a verbal 10-second warning and then muted when two minutes have passed to allow for as much participation as possible. Disruptive conduct will not be allowed. If there are disruptions, a warning will be given. And if the disruption continues, a community member will be muted and then injected from our Zoom meeting. So thank you so much in advance for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, feel comfortable, feel respected and safe. So with that, I will turn it over to our budget director, Jessica Kennard, who will provide a brief overview of the city's budget. Jessica. Great, thank you, Eileen. I am attempting to share a brief presentation. I will be very brief. Um, just a moment here, my apologies. I have done this a number of times, but for whatever reason, it is giving me trouble right now. Oh dear. 
So I am going to go ahead and just talk about the overview that I was going to give because for whatever reason, my screen is having trouble sharing. And I do want to make sure that we preserve most of the time for you all to speak. Um, but I wanted you to know that um, in line with um, Eileen's talking points, we have gone through um, really unprecedented time budgetarily and financially. Um, we were on track last September to have um, a really optimistic budget cycle. And during that time, the mayor issued budget guidance that for the first time asked for no general fund reductions and asked bureaus to collaborate on a number of key priority areas. As uh, as most as recent as last February, just three short months ago, we anticipated having a $28.5 million general fund surplus. Then COVID-19 happened and everything changed. Um, very quickly after the governor declared the stay home, stay safe order, um, we um, re-looked at our financial projections and our city economist, Josh Harwood, provided an update to our revenue forecast that showed a $75 million decline in our discretionary resource. That is about a 13% decline in our discretionary resource. So we quickly had to shift gears as we sought to um, stay to the, the required timelines associated with our budget process. And we released the mayor's proposed budget uh, last week, um, but balancing to this new revenue picture, um, we prioritized as part of the actions that we took uh, looking for any and all uh, solutions that preserved our current services and our, um, our employees. Uh, we solved about $59 million of the projected shortfall by, uh, by not affecting bureau budgets. And then we um, took some cost containment strategies across the city to try to even the reductions um, and even the, the impact of the reductions across bureaus, again, to try to preserve as many services and um, jobs as possible. We did end up um, asking bureaus for some follow-up reductions as part of our um, preparation for our fall budget monitoring process. We at the city not only budget annually, but we also have points during the year when we open up the budget to make mostly technical true-ups. However, this year we anticipate that the coming fall process will be more significant as we look to better understand what our financial picture looks like and look towards further potential reduction options from bureaus in the fall. So it has been a really unprecedented spring for all of us for a number of reasons, but um, uh, significantly so from a budget standpoint. Um, I appreciate uh, all of the time and energy that you all have spent uh, in being here with us today, and I look forward to your public testimony. Wait, you Thank you, Director Kennard. Okay, now we will turn it over to Mayor Wheeler to convene Budget Committee. Mayor? Thank you very much. Uh, we are now convened as the City of Portland Budget Committee. Carla, actually before we do that, under Portland City Code and State Law, the City Council is holding this meeting electronically. All members of the council are attending remotely by phone and the city has made several avenues available for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The public can also provide written testimony to council by emailing the council clerk. The council is taking these steps as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing. The pandemic is an emergency that threatens the public health, safety and welfare which requires us to meet remotely by electronic communications. Thank you all for your patience, your flexibility and understanding as we manage through this difficult situation to do the city's business. With that, Carla, please call the roll. Hardesty? Aye. You Daly? Here. Fritz? Here. Wheeler? Here. Okay, thank you. And now we will hear Mayor Wheeler's message on his proposed budget. Mayor? Thank you, Eileen. Thank you all for joining us tonight. Before we move into testimony, I'd like to share a brief overview, overview of this year's proposed budget. This is like any budget I've ever produced. Who could have imagined even just three months ago that we'd be facing the challenges now before us? 
Portlanders, along with so many people around the world, have been suddenly and deeply impacted by COVID-19. We've been hurt financially, socially, and emotionally. And cities all around the country are facing budget crises to go along with the public health crisis of this pandemic. Through this budget and um, the additional resources that'll be flowing to your community to help us respond to COVID-19, I'm focused on supporting frontline communities that have been hurt first and worst. COVID-19 has not only highlighted inequities in our community, it's magnified them. People of color, struggling families, people living outside, vulnerable tenants and small business owners, these Portlanders have been hit hardest by this crisis and they must be our top priority as we invest in our recovery. We have both an opportunity and a responsibility to take advantage of this moment, to re-examine the way we do things, who our systems benefit and don't, and to rebuild a more equitable way forward. As you may have heard or read, we expect a general fund revenue shortfall of $75 million next year. But our budget is built on a strong foundation and we will be able to largely withstand the economic blow of this pandemic. There's no easy way to cut your budget by $75 million. But thanks to the good decisions by this council and by our predecessors, we've been able to close almost 90% of the gap without big impacts to our programs or to our city staff. We've also been able to make investments in key areas to keep core city services running and to support frontline communities hit hardest by COVID-19. These include funding for the Joint Office of Homeless Services, street lights and curb cuts to make our streets and sidewalks safer and more accessible, our park system, support for undocumented Portlanders, climate action, and other council priorities. I'm very proud of these investments. To close the rest of the gap, we're asking our bureaus to take cuts. We want to give them time to be thoughtful about what cuts to take, so we're not doing it now. We'll make those decisions in the fall. One note before we begin, there have been numbers taken out of context about this budget by some community members specifically about the Portland Police Bureau. Concerns that the Portland Police Bureau's budget has increased when other bureaus have not. Here are the facts. The Police Bureau, along with bureaus across the city, are all taking cuts. The increases pointed out by the community are mostly not part of the discretionary general fund dollars that we're talking about tonight. They reflect changes for pension benefits and for a planned technology project. Hopefully, this provides some insight for those planning on testifying about the Police Bureau's budget specifically this evening. So to summarize, we avoided what could have been a financial freefall, and we've developed a budget that protects the most vulnerable in our community. And on top of that, Portland is a strong and resilient city. It won't be easy, it won't be fast, but our community will get through this and we will recover. My council colleagues and I appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight, and we look forward to your input. Eileen? Thank you, Mayor Wheeler. So now we can begin public comments. Remember, there will be two minutes for testimony. City staff will time the testimony and they will give you a verbal 10 second warning. Please finish your comment promptly within two minutes to allow time for others commenting. When you have been unmuted, you will be notified. And when your name is called, you can begin your comments. Remember to mute the broadcast of the program while you give your comment to avoid any echo. And if you have access to the broadcast, please consider leaving the meeting when you are finished with your comments. This will support the staff administering this call. One note before we begin with public testimony, however, it looks like everyone who signed up isn't reflected in our Zoom meeting page right now. So please be patient with us as we navigate this in real time considering this is an unprecedented virtual press conference, uh, not press conference, virtual public forum meeting. And uh, there will likely be some technical glitches that we learn along the way. So thank you again for your patience. Thank you again for helping your fellow Portlanders feel welcome, comfortable, respected, and safe. So Carla, 
If you can please read our first name. The first person is Rio. Hi, uh, my name is Rio Chanel. I live in the Kearns neighborhood of Portland, Oregon, and I come here representing Care Not Cops PDX. Last night in front of City Hall, we screened an hour-long compilation of testimony from community members, members who are teachers, nurses, social workers, people who deeply care about their communities and the folks they work with. They pleaded and demanded for the city to divest from policing and instead invest in real solutions for our communities like housing, healthcare, food, fareless transit, rent relief, and so much more. They shared their own experiences with police violence in Portland, discussed the impacts policing has had on their family and friends, and made it clear that policing does not keep our communities safe. We were driven to take this action last night because the city canceled all three community budget forms scheduled for April without rescheduling them, which you have acknowledged. Um, and as much as we understand this unprecedented time, we still need to make sure that more voices from the community would be heard. All the city commissioners were invited and to our knowledge, the only commissioner who attended was Joanne Hardesty. So thank you, Joanne. In closing, I just wanna reinforce the sentiment that city commissioners and the mayor have a responsibility to serve the public and prioritize the needs of the community. And I ask that you please consider the proposed budget increase for the Portland Police Bureau and instead invest in those struggling in your community. Thank you for your time. Thank you. The next person is Kelsey Provo. Welcome, Kelsey. Kelsey, are you unmuted? I should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yeah, now we can. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Kelsey Provo, and I'm an attorney with Innovation Law Lab. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I'm speaking on behalf of Equity Corps of Oregon, or ECHO. The testimony I'm providing today was prepared jointly by Adriana Miranda, the Executive Director of CAUSA and Innovation Law Lab. COVID-19 is demonstrating that the deportation system under the Trump administration threatens Oregon's public health and undermines the principles of inclusion that the city of Portland has affirmed. There are approximately 7,300 cases pending before the Portland Immigration Court. Represented immigrants are five and a half times more likely to prevent an unlawful deportation, yet immigrants in deportation proceedings must represent themselves if they cannot afford an attorney. ECHO has prevented the deportations of 1,096 Oregonians. Over half of the individuals currently receiving legal services from ECHO are Portland city residents. COVID-19 has exacerbated the need for universal representation as the Trump administration uses the pandemic to justify aggressive changes to our nation's immigration laws. Despite health concerns, the immigration courts continue to function and filing deadlines remain in place. ECHO clients with upcoming final hearings who were already matched with an ECHO attorney have had their hearings unilaterally postponed. Due to the court's backlog, these final hearings will be rescheduled well beyond the date that ECHO funding is set to expire. Portland city residents make up one third of those at risk of losing their attorney. ICE has continued its enforcement during the pandemic and at a time when our communities are more vulnerable. In March, ICE detained over 10,000 people nationwide. ICE's continued enforcement directly endangers our Portland community. Importantly, if the, DACA, if the Supreme Court holds the DACA program unlawful, our DACA community will be stripped of this protection and subject to deportation. Without ECHO, Portland's DACA community members will be forced to represent themselves in immigration court if they cannot afford a private attorney. Universal representation helps the city meet its equity values and principles. ECHO is a critical facet of the city of Portland's sanctuary status, leveling the playing field between a sophisticated and inhumane immigration system and the people it victimizes. The city of Portland and the state of Oregon are leading examples for the nation for sanctuary law and universal representation. We urge the city to invest in Portlanders who will face an inequitable system and deportation without public intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. The next person is Joanne Reese. Hello. Welcome, Joanne. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Thanks. My name is Joanne Reese Lucchini. I live in Lens, 
Coronavirus response funding needs to be well-intentioned and intentional. In very challenging times for everyone, there's an even greater need for accountability, transparency, and equity. The city must avoid any perception of triaging, where certain struggling marginalized groups' needs are prioritized over other equally struggling, equally marginalized groups' needs. If this means providing everyone in Portland with a cash infusion similar to the federal stimulus, so be it. Rent and mortgage relief is also imperative for impacted households, as is housing for houseless neighbors. Recent coronavirus response funding through Prosper Small Business Relief and Portland Housing Bureau cash assistance seem to not be that intentional or equitable. With the Prosper grants, accessing the relief was high barrier. Outreach was last minute, requiring fast turnaround and extensive supporting documentation. In addition, the eligibility criteria seemed to flip-flop after the fact, implying selective flexibility. With PHB, there are 19 nonprofits with $800,000 of coronavirus funding to be dispersed by June 30th. Who are the 19 nonprofits? How much of this money will be headed towards administration? Limiting community access to opportunity through poor outreach, high barriers to participation, and flip-flopping eligibility criteria is potentially discriminatory. It allows too many people to fall between the cracks. No one is dispensable or disposable. Need is need, and the need is great. For our collective survival, human needs must be prioritized over status quo bureaucratic bloat. There will be no tolerance for crony disaster capitalism at the city government, nonprofit, or developer levels. Taxpayer-funded public resources must be equally shared. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next person is Shannon Kearns. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Great. Shannon. Thank you. Good evening, city commissioners and mayor. My name is Shannon Kearns, and I live in Solid. I am a mother of two and a full-time student. I also organize with a mutual aid group called Free Lunch Collective, where we work to provide just under 600 sack lunches each week. And that does include two of the uh, houseless camps that were opened in Southeast Portland. I am also a member of Care Not Cops, and I'm here to testify on behalf of Care Not Cops. Uh, Care Not Cops is here once again for the fourth year in a row to demand that the city of Portland divest from the violence of policing and invest in lasting solutions for community resources and safety instead. Over the past four years, the Portland Police Bureau budget has increased by $47 million. Last year, the city adopted a policing budget of over $238 million. This year, Police Commissioner and Mayor Ted Wheeler is proposing a nearly $7 million increase to bring the total PP budget to just over $245 million. This is 34% of the city's general fund. This is not acceptable. If Portland had instead been investing this ever-increasing millions of dollars into necessary life-affirming resources to under-resourced communities, we would have the ability to solve many of the social issues that policing claims to address. Portland City Council must reject the $7 million increase to the already enormous PPB budget. Increasing funding for policing does not create more safety. Increasing funding for the PPB increases violence. Policing further endangers the health of communities during the COVID-19 pandemic and has always functioned to cage, control, and kill Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities. Queer and trans people, people who are houseless, people with disabilities, and many others living at the margins of society. We have already seen that across the country, social distancing orders have been used as justification for the continued surveillance, harassment, and terrorization of black and brown communities at the hands of police. White people are handed face masks, make face masks while black people are assaulted and arrested. This has to end. We need to invest in community and care and not cops. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next is Anna Swanson. Hi. Good evening, Anna. Me? Yep. Welcome. Great. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Anna Swanson, and I live in the King neighborhood of Portland. Um, I'm a drag artist, a member of the queer and trans community here. 
and I work in downtown Portland with houseless youth, many of whom are black and brown youth um, and queer and trans youth. Um, I'm speaking today both on behalf of Care Not Cops and from the work that I do um, with Outside the Frame, um, mentoring youth to learn film production and digital storytelling. And um, I know that we've had the privilege of working with the city on a variety of projects over my time there. Um, but I am deeply concerned about the way that the city funding choices do not actually reflect the needs of the houseless youth that you so often celebrate at City Hall, and that the money that is poured into policing every year is funding a system that harms these youth daily through the violence of policing, as well as so many of the other community members of color, queer and trans folks, and poor folks in Portland. Um, during a check-in today, during um, a filmmaking workshop that we we're hosting over Zoom, I shared with the youth some of the work that I do outside of work to advocate around the budget every year through Care Not Cops. And I shared with them that the total proposed Portland Police Bureau budget for 2020-21 um, is um, $245,169,804. And I am not exaggerating when I say that they were shocked and visibly angry. Um, I asked the youth that I work with what they would want to spend that money on. And they told me things like housing that they can afford, housing that is free, housing for all, um, education and the resources to access it, which in this time means getting everybody internet, getting everybody laptops, getting ways to join the kinds of programming that we are um, trying to provide them with. Um, universal health care, especially trans health care and mental health care for everyone who wants and needs it. Um, they are brilliant young people who know that what we need is our needs to be met and resources provided. And I am very honored to share their ideas with you tonight. Um, Portland communities, especially the youth that I work with daily, know that policing is not the solution to safety, but actually creates more violence in our city, further endangering the health of our communities, especially in this time of a pandemic. Um, we know that lasting solutions must be built through investments in resources people need to survive and thrive, such as stable housing and healthcare for all, not through financing the conditions of violence, repression, fear, and surveillance, and sweeping these youth every day that threatens the safety and livelihood of the most vulnerable memories, members of our community. I would ask you to please consider how putting that almost $246 million into things like housing and healthcare for the youth that I work with, instead of sweeping them and policing so many of their neighbors, how that could create the conditions for an actually thriving and um, full of care Portland. Um, what they need and what we need and what they have told me is care, not cops. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Anna. The next person is Carly Boerke. Good evening, Carly. Carly, are you uh, are you on board? And are you? Can you check and see if you're muted? There we go. Am I muted? Nope, you're good now. Thank you. Good to go. Okay, thank you. Um, hello, my name is Carly Burke, and I live in the Key neighborhood of Northeast Portland. I'm here to talk to you as a citizen and a social worker for homeless youth here in Portland. I, my coworkers, and youth I work with have all witnessed and experienced violence at the hands of the Portland police. I have youth who wake up extra early to ask me to wake everyone up on the block before the police do to harass them, laugh at them, and trash their belongings. This is true. Um, youth do not know where their belongings are. They do not know that their belongings are put in a storage facility. Youth do not have a place to go when shelter is full, when it feels unsafe to stay in, or when they have nights out for messy beds, among other things. They have nowhere to go besides sleeping outside. Yet business owners and city officials think it's okay to uproot someone's entire life who has nothing, give them a citation or a jail sentence and put their life's belongings in the garbage. I implore you to step into that position. If someone came to your house, told you to move and then demolished it, all of your belongings, there has to be a better thing that we can put money into besides kicking and quite literally murdering people when they are down. The police don't need more money to harass our neighbors who are suffering the most. We need to put those funds into long-term housing solutions, mental health care outreach, and recovery services. All of us social workers are working with crumbs in this city 
to work against the current of the police department who continues to traumatize the people we are trying to help. I'm here to ask you to take that money that is allotted to the Portland police and invest it in life-sustaining resources like housing for our community. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Carly. Next is Thu Fan. Phil, are you muted? Uh, Carla, why don't you skip to the next person, then if Phil, let's call on Phil uh, after the next person and see if we can get him on board. Certainly. The next person is Dung Ho. Hello. Uh, can you all hear me? Oddly and clearly. Hi. Uh, good evening, um, commissioners and mayor. Um, thank you for having us all here today uh, virtually. My name is Yung Ho. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm the tenant education and support director at Community Alliance of Tenants. CAT, as most of you may know, is Oregon's oldest tenant-led membership organization advocating for and with renters for safe, stable, and affordable housing. Our work is led by renters who are most impacted, people with disabilities, low-wage workers, people of color, immigrants, and refugees. Our renters' rights hotline manager, Tim Orr, was not able to join tonight because he is running our hotline. We actually just launched live hotline hours for our CAT members, and this is our second uh, pilot week of that. So I asked him what he wanted to share with you all tonight, um, and we spoke about the necessity of, uh, of our services and programs during the pandemic and post-pandemic. So these are his words. Our work is just as important as ever. Tenants who were stable before have become destabilized in their housing. Tenants who were unstable before have become even more unstable. People need a place to go that will help them navigate this situation with empathy and compassion. CAT can provide that. And so we ask that you continue to support our work with ongoing stable, sustainable funds in the next fiscal year and beyond. Uh, and thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate your being here. Let's see. Is uh, Thu Fan on yet? Do we know? Um, let's go with uh, Violetta Alvarez. Two fan is is uh, able to talk now. You uh, said not, Rick. Go ahead, Thu. Oh, he's on. Sorry, they're on. Sorry. Welcome. He's unmuted. Carla, could you call the name again, please? Uh, the person we're trying to get is yes. Fan. I believe Rick said he is unmuted. T H U Y P H. Well, for, for some reason, we're not hearing that individual. We'll have to go on to the next. Okay. The next is Violeta Alvarez. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hi, my name is Violeta Alvarez and I'm with the Community Alliance of Tenants. I first want to thank you for your continued support that has allowed us to provide essential information, resources, and tools to tenants throughout the city of Portland to ensure that they have access to safer, affordable housing and that they can remain housed. Our hotline is one of our key services to inform tenants, empower them, and connect them to resources and support that they need. During this time, our hotline has been extremely valuable in informing tenants in different languages about the new laws, changes, and updates, and other housing information. I will be reading a testimony from a tenant that reached out to us through our hotline. Quote, my name is Brenda Lara, former resident of Portland, and I am pleased to write this testimony for the great support and benefit that CAT has been to me. I can now pass information to others about CAT and about the um, 
The work can offer to tenants to educate us, support us, and guide us in our tenant rights, since by not being informed, we can be easily mistreated, as it was my case. I am grateful for CAT and its support for all the information in Spanish at no cost, so that I could face my situation with determination, since I would not have been able to resolve the situation on my own. And I am sure that, like myself, there are a number of tenants whose support from CAT is fundamental in order to protect ourselves according to our rights, which, as we know, there are unfortunately many cases of abuse of power, but CAT as an organization is there to support us all. We are many tenants who take advantage of CAT's great services and work, and I hope that their work can continue to support many more tenants with the great disposition and service that they provided me. I am deeply grateful to CAT. Quote, again, I want to emphasize that with your support, we are able to provide services and information to tenants like Brenda and others in the community, particularly those who are disproportionately impacted by the housing crisis, such as Black, Indigenous, people of color, immigrants and refugees, low income and disabled tenants. It is important that CATS programs continue to receive ongoing sustainable funds to support tenants through the pandemic and beyond. Again, thank you for your continued support in the com coming fiscal year. Thank you for joining us and sharing your thoughts. We appreciate it. Next is Andrew Brown. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Andrew Brown and I represent uh, Metro Home Share, a home sharing uh, organization here in Portland. Um, Metro Home Share develops at least 12 affordable units of housing every year. Metro Home Share was removed from the budget for 2021. Um, I'm here to appeal to the city council to please consider the fact that Metro Home Share brought 12 units of affordable housing into our community for less than $100,000. That's not each, that is for all 12. By the nature of this program, these units are shared. So 24 low income and extremely low income community members were housed for one year for an investment of $100,000, or actually the contract was for 90, so 2750 a piece. And that price goes down, the better we get. These units are hey, Andrew. developed. Hello? Hello, Andrew, excuse me. This is Commissioner Hardesty. I just have a question for you. Yes. When you say low income, what do you mean? What is the income? 87% of our home seekers are zero to 30, and 52% of our home providers are below 50% MFI. Thank you. That's helpful. These units are cited, developed, and leased up in an average of three months. They have no carbon footprint, no zoning or NIMBY issues, and are nearly 100 times cheaper than a new unit. Home sharing keeps seniors in their homes and contributing to their communities. They provide safe, decent, and affordable housing that is embedded in our neighborhoods, including high opportunity areas. We have units serving 0 to 30 AMI residents in West Hills, Lake Oswego, and King City. It is very difficult to reckon that the city of Portland is willing to forego 12 deeply affordable to affordable units per year in the face of the current housing challenges and what is surely to come once mortgage and rent moratoriums are lifted. Thank you very much. Thank you, appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna try Sue Fan again. We believe he's there connected. Yeah, he's working on the, uh, the microphone. Rick is working with him. Okay. So maybe on to the next person while we wait. Yeah, let's let's keep going, and then uh, then uh, when uh, Three Fans' microphone is fixed, we'll take take testimony. Next is Sharon Eldridge. Good evening, Sharon. Yes. Okay. Hi, um, I'm a volunteer with Community Lines of Tenants. You've heard testimony from a couple of the staff already. I work specifically with the letter writing clinic at CAT. I actually don't work with the hotline, but the hotline is the funnel that sends tenants to me where I help them write letters to their landlords. Um, in the four years I worked at CAT, I have seen tenants in dire situations. Um, and actually I haven't written any letters with tenants lately. CAT is closed and no one has, you know, haven't, I haven't had anyone funneled to me. So I can only imagine what tenants are experiencing now. Actually, I, you know, I'm, I'm kind of out of the loop currently, but knowing what baseline was and how dire baseline was, 
I would just really like to see us make tenant protections, um, you know, just more, more fairness in laws and rights for, for tenants. I'd just like to see that going forward with any budget considerations that we really consider people at the borders, at the margins of, of staying in their housing, that we really make that a priority in our budget considerations. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Sure. They're asking me to try through Fan again. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Now we now we hear children. Oh, I know. Yeah. Okay, uh, Sharon, I think you're still live. Am I still on? Oh, sorry. Yeah. How do I? Oh, I will. Yeah, down on the lower left. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> Carla, where are we? Uh, next is Margot Black. Thank you. Margot, are you on board? I think myself. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Sorry, I couldn't figure out what I was supposed to do there. Um, Sorry. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, uh, Mayor and Commissioners, for providing this opportunity um, for the public to testify on the budget tonight. My name is Margo Black. I am co-chair of Portland Tenants United, a registered lobby organization. However, I am not testifying in an official capacity for PTU this evening. I uh, believe one of my um, other organizers will be doing that. Um, as a candidate for city council, and I am running for city council seat number two, I'm often asked how I, as a commissioner, would handle um, a predicted $100 million budget shortfall resulting from COVID. So I'm grateful that our general fund shortfall is only predicted to be $75 million and very grateful to hear that the needs of vulnerable and marginalized community members are being prioritized. As we've already heard, COVID has shown a uh, spotlight on the cracks that our system already allows people to fall through. And those cracks are wider and deeper and much more punishing. As a tenant advocate and activist, I can't agree more from uh, with those from CAP who've just testified. Uh, my inbox the last two months feels like doing triage during a Category 5 earthquake. Uh, it just feels like carnage. And I don't think we have even seen what's to come after uh, the eviction moratorium ends and um, and we see the full impact of telling renters that um, they have months of accrued rent to pay back or they need to face eviction. Um, so here's the thing. Um, we need to match our rhetoric about these unprecedented times with unprecedented action in order to ensure that we really do emerge stronger, more resilient, and actually close those cracks so that we're ready for the next pandemic. Um, or the earthquake or our encroaching climate crisis. And this means more than prioritizing those most impacted when deciding what to cut, it means no cuts. It means raising revenue so that instead of cutting services, we're expanding services and programs and opportunities so that we are ready. The old normal wasn't working for so many of us. And if we truly uh, believe that we aren't gonna head back to the old normal, but we want a better and healthier city, um, then we need to think outside the box on our, our budget and start to ask, where is the money? It's out there and we need to go get it. We need to tax the rich. We need a progressive taxation on, uh, on corporations. There, the money is out there. Uh, yes, many, many of us have lost our jobs. There are lots of businesses are losing revenue. Our small businesses are uh, you know, shuttering forever, um, potentially. But that doesn't mean that there is no money. Some businesses are booming under this, and the stock market has rewarded many uh, during the last two months. And it is time to finally go capture that revenue and fund our budget uh, to actually protect those most marginalized and vulnerable in our community. We need to create a massive relief fund for rent. Um, we need to robustly expand the rental services office so that um, we have actually have the ability uh, to um, address the, uh, the deplorable situation that we just learned about in Coin Six's expose of 
home forward and income property management. Um, those That was a report uh, that was 14 months in the making. It had nothing to do with COVID. And this is a taxpayer funded homelessness crisis and eviction crisis that we can't do anything about until it is someone's job at the city to pick up the phone when a renter calls and says, my landlord is bullying the entire building and not fixing anything and retaliating against us when we try to do anything about it. Right now, it is no one's job to do anything about that. No one will- Time is up, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. I believe we're gonna try through Van again. Hi, can you hear me? Yay, loud and clear. Oh, great. So my name is Tui Fan. I am working at CAT, the Community Alliance of Tenants. I've been here over three years and I'm here testifying for CAT. I love working with tenants, volunteers, and partners. I like to be out in the community, listen to their story, and learn how to be there for them and be their advocate. My daily job is to be on the hotline to insist tenants about landlord tenant law and be in the of the partner organization such as um, a panel and Urku to meet tenants and help them with their housing issue. Let them know about their rights, help them write letters to their landlord management about their housing issue, have workshops about landlord tenant law, refer them to resources and advocate for them. Most of the tenants that I work with are vulnerable people with a lot of barriers, especially the Vietnamese community that I work closely with. It's my pleasure to be out there in the community and with them and meet the great people. I am still learning every day through my work and through the people that I meet. I love my job and I am proud to be a part of CAT. It is important that CAT programs is continue to receive ongoing sustainable funding to support tenants through the pandemic and beyond. And thank you for your continued support of the fiscal year. Thank you, and thank you for uh, to working through the bugs and your testimony. We appreciate it. It's good to hear your testimony. Thank you. Next is Michael Lindman. Good evening, Michael. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Hi. Uh, thank you to Council for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Uh, my name is Mike Lindman. I am the Parks Chair of the Maplewood Neighborhood Association but I am speaking to you tonight on behalf of the Southwest Neighborhoods Parks Committee. COVID-19 is placing untold pain upon our community physically and emotionally. The strain caused by social isolation, financial instability, and concerns for the health and well-being of ourselves and our loved ones makes the needs for parks especially imperative. We see day in day out that our park system is key to maintaining the health and well-being of Portlanders. We ask for the diligence of the city in helping folks enjoy the benefits of the outdoor spaces while maintaining the recommended social distancing guidelines from our public health officials. We commend the park greeters system that started last month and urge the parks department to expand its reach into as many parks as possible for everyone's safety, especially as we attempt to slowly reemerge from the stay at home orders in the coming months. We recognize the closing of our pools, community centers and art centers as necessary but unfortunate. We feel for the hundreds of valued parks and recreation employees that have been laid off or not hired. The difficulties of this situation does, not, however, does however present an opportunity that parks can fast track any maintenance and construction projects originating from the capital accounts. With physical buildings closed, no public to worry about, and a workforce in need now seems like the perfect time to build and renew what infrastructure we can. The strong community use of our park system in this time of great upheaval only goes to underline its importance in the weeks, months, and years to come. We are in support of the park's budget and commend the park's leadership for their stewardship in this difficult time. While much of Council's efforts will rightly be focused on the near-term problems COVID-19 has wrought, we urge you not to lose sight of the future. While we understand the extreme difficulties the current budget reflects, it underscores the importance of moving the park's budget to a more consistent and dedicated stream of funding for the future. We do not wish to see the efforts undertaken thus far by the parks and council to lose momentum. We urge the process to continue and offer our assistance in any way we can. On behalf of the Southwest Neighborhoods Parks Committee, we hope that everyone is staying safe and healthy in these incredibly challenging times. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your testimony, Mike. 
I thought you had left, Mayor. I was just filling in for you. Oh, no, I'm here. <laughs> Next is Ellie Gr Graziger. Can you hear me? Loudly and clearly. Yes, we can. Amazing. All right. Hi, my name is Ellie Graziger. I live in the Cully neighborhood and I work as a high school teacher in Portland Public Schools. I'm here to speak on behalf of the many voices that are silenced today because of the lack of public access to this process of budget negotiation due to canceling most opportunities for public testimony. I'm also here to speak on behalf of the folks celebrating the life of Keaton Otis, which was taken by the gang enforcement team, currently the gun violence reduction team 10 years ago today. We still demand justice. The topic I wish directly to speak to today is the increase of $7 million to the Portland police budget an increase that I personally firmly disagree with as both a Portlander and a teacher. As a teacher in a diverse high school, I hear stories all the time of police harassment towards my students. These stories are very well documented and we are forcing our students into activist roles when we don't listen to them. They have told you time and time again with their organizing and their protests that they feel unsafe with SROs in their schools. Black students grow up learning about the school to prison pipeline targeting them and you continue to fund it. I propose more mental health services, more social workers, more teachers, support staff. The mayor's proposed budget also allocates over $4 million for PPB's Transit Police Division, which works with 11 other agencies to criminalize and murder people utilizing TriMet, particularly youth of color. Rest in peace, Terrell Johnson. In budget forms in past years, you've heard about the dire impacts of policing and criminalization on public transit. Opal Environmental Justice Oregon and their youth environmental Justice Alliance and Bus Riders Unite programs have asked for accessible and fearless transit and free youth pass, which you kick to PPS to fund. These $4 million must be used to support a fearless public transit system and ensure this, that this essential public service is truly accessible and free for all. Criminalizing poverty and severely limiting people's freedom of movement is not the answer. Please, I urge you, reject the proposed $7 million increase to the police budget. I hope you go home tonight and dream of care not cops. Thank you for your time. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. Uh, may I ask Ellie a question? Yeah, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, thank you, Ellie. I appreciate your testimony. I was just curious if you were here at the beginning and heard the mayor's explanation about the police budget. There, in fact, is not a increase in the budget other than what would be traditionally a cost of living um, and some computer purchase. Um, a, a, a computer uh, purchase that uh, that's ongoing. Um, sure. Were you here for that part? Unfortunately, it took me some time to log on. Um, I'm curious about that part, but I still, in pandemic times, um, yeah. disagree with even that type of increase, um, especially as teachers for are furloughing ourselves. So um, I did miss that part, though. Okay, well, I just, wanted, I just wanted you to have good information. I absolutely support your premise around transit police officers. Um, we have a proposed budget that has not been approved as of yet. We'll do that next week. Um, but so I appreciate your testimony and would love to get it in writing if you have it in writing. Um, you could just email it to the board clerk and she will make sure that we all get it. Amazing, yeah, I can do that. Thank you so much. Thank you, appreciate your testimony. Next is Scout Lee. Welcome, Scout. Hey. Thank you. Um, my name's Scout. I live in North Portland. I'm a member of ILWU Local 5. Uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Care Not Cops, in coordination with 30 other community organizations, recently wrote a statement and conducted phone zaps urging City Council to take necessary measures to protect the safety and well-being of the most vulnerable members of our community during the COVID-19 pandemic. The systems of policing and incarceration have no role in public health or safety. It is evident now more than ever that true safety looks like resources such as housing, food security, rent assistance, and healthcare. To increase the police budget at the same time that this pandemic has further threatened the livelihood of people already struggling to access these essential resources is betrayal of the very people you claim to represent. Almost 900 individuals signed on to our demands advocating for city and state resources to be directed towards mm -hmm. cultivating conditions people need to survive instead of policing and incarceration. 
In the midst of a global pandemic that is disproportionately affecting Black communities, and when there is even more need for support than before in the city, the mayor has proposed a $7 million increase to the already well over $200 million police budget. This police budget, whether or not these current increases you say are specifically for cost of living increases, has increased by $47 million in only the last four years. We saw that in response to this pandemic, city council instead decided to take money out of the already too small housing bureau budget to provide a too small stimulus fund to only a handful of families. Why couldn't the police budget be the fund that these funds were taken out of? Let me remind you, you're proposing $245 million to go to the police. The stimulus package was only $3 million. We know that policing does not keep communities safe. We know that investing in communities keeps them safe. This means investing in education, housing, health care, mental health care, free transit, resources for undocumented people, child care, and other community-determined resources. When communities are equipped with the resources they need to live safely, there is no need for policing. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Lior Schweitzer. Lior, welcome. Hello. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for the record. My name is Lior Schweitzer. Uh, for transparency, I want to state that I am a City of Portland employee, but that my testimony today is not in any way related to that. I'm speaking of Portland Tents United as an organizer. Uh, I want to start by recognizing that the, by stating that we recognize that the shortfall facing are of massive proportion, something that we haven't seen in a very long time. And want to start by really applauding the mayor while working through this budget and trying to keep some really important resources available. We were very happy to see that homeless services in the Portland Housing Bureau budget received even more money than was requested in the initial budget, and that the rental services office received almost as much money as they requested. Uh, this was not the austerity budget that we feared would come in the face of these types of shortfalls. But we also know that we need to see more. As has been mentioned by members of CAT and by Margo, harassment of tenants has gone through the roof. Portland Tents United has been receiving constant barrage of messages from tenants who are dealing with intense situations with their landlords because of the current situation. And without rent forgiveness and rent debt cancellation, evictions are coming once the payment period for rent is going to be up. That means that in order to protect tenants, we really need a big and bold rental services office. And we think that especially now that there are millions of dollars coming in from the registration fee for landlords, this is the time to maintain and increase the investment in that office even beyond what the Portland Housing Bureau requested to make sure that they can provide the services that are needed. Tenants need legal support when they're going to get this, this type of harassment and these evictions. Tenants need support in the form of hotlines like CATS or hotlines provided directly by the rental services office to explain to them what their rights are and to explain to them how to assert their rights. And we need to figure out how to provide more rental assistance, whether through the city budget. Time is up. Federal stimulus. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it very much. Next is Hung Nam. Can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Great. Hi, my name is Hyung Nam. I'm one of the coordinating committee members of the Portland Metro People's Coalition of over 20 community organizations. We were part of the community struggle last year over the city budget, especially to save vital parks programs from cuts. That work led me to carefully study the city's budget and volunteer to serve on the budget advisory committee for the Portland Police Bureau. Budgets are moral documents. Joseph Schumpeter remarked after World War I, the budget is the skeleton of the state stripped of all misleading ideologies, the truest reflection of the re distribution of power and influence. Portland spends over 50% of its general funds on public safety, of which the majority is spent on policing. We need to think about what Portland really needs and think about what public safety means. 
Portland Police Bureau has consistently shown that they don't serve the public. Their own study found over 71% of Portland residents have little trust of the police with even higher levels of distrust among people of color. Furthermore, the majority of Portland police's arrests have been of low, um, for low-level offenses of unhoused people. Policing unhoused people is a violation of human rights. It also perpetuates a cycle of criminalization that traps people in poverty, ultimately costing the city, county, and state more money. Relying on police to respond to homelessness is not only more expensive than relying on social workers, but it's also much, more, much less effective. The PPB has requested additional funds for overtime for, to police protests in this coming election year. From what we have seen, over-policing using riot cops and military weapons does not help public safety. It has led to not only violation of people's rights, but also results in costly civil suits and insurance policies. The PPB's consistent use of riot gear, flashbang grenades, and chemical agents against the public is actually inimical to public safety. And with COVID-19 this election year, it's even more unlikely that such policing will be needed. Furthermore, PPB is requesting seven additional FTE for its SWAT team this um, in the new requested budget. This is not only wasteful, but it would feed into the problematic policing we do not time need. Is I'm sorry, am I out of time? Yes, your time's up. Thank you. Thank you. Next person is Kate Hall. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, hi, my name is Kate. I live in downtown Portland, and I am a social work student at PSU. If this budget is a moral document, as Mayor Wheeler has said, what does this say about the values of you, the mayor, the police commissioner, and the city council, if you decide to approve this proposed budget as it is written? When the sweeping of houseless communities is funded while thousands of apartments sit vacant, when youth of color are surveilled and harassed by police, while school and park programs are cut. Nearly $4 million in this proposed police bureau budget is allocated to keep school resource officers in Portland public schools. Last year, PPS students, parents, and teachers demanded and won the reversal of an agreement that would have funded additional SROs in schools. This resounding opposition made clear that students do not feel safe with police on campus and that SROs only enhance the school to prison pipeline and school push out of black and brown students. It also made clear that what the students need are adequately trained and more black teachers, counselors, and other educational resources for students, which is exactly what this $4 million should be funding. I am here today with Care Not Cops. It's time to invest in people, not policing. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Next is Rachel Christ. Good evening, Rachel. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. My name is Rachel Christ. I live in Northeast Portland and work in research and organize with Care Not Cops. Care Not Cops is here once again to demand that the city of Portland divest from the violence of policing and invest in lasting community resources and safety instead. Given the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, the city should invest in real solutions for our communities like housing, healthcare, food, fareless transit, rent relief, and so much more. Over the past four years, the Portland Police Bureau budget has increased by 47 million. Last year, the city adopted a policing budget of over 238 million. This year, Police Commissioner and Mayor Ted Wheeler are proposing a nearly $7 million increase to bring the total PP budget to just over $245 million. It does not matter where these funds come from. The PPB budget is far, far too large as it is. This is not acceptable. Further increases are not acceptable. The Portland City Council must reject this increase to the already enormous PPB budget and should look to further reduce the budget in order to bolster budgets that actually support and care for our communities. If Portland had instead been investing these millions of dollars into necessary life-affirming resources to under-resourced communities, many of the social issues that policing claims to address would be solved. Policing further endangers the health of communities during the COVID-19 pandemic and has always functioned to cage, control, and kill Black, 
brown and indigenous communities, queer and trans people, people who are houseless, people with disabilities, and many others living at the margins of society. Increasing funding of policing does not create more safety. Increasing funding for the PBB increases violence. I'm here today with Care Not Cops. We've already seen that across the country, social distancing orders have been used as, a just, as justification for the continued surveillance, harassment, and terrorization of black and brown communities at the hands of the police. White people are given face masks by the police while black people are assaulted and arrested. This has to end. You can help end it. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next is Devin Baer. Good evening, Devin. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we sure can, thank you. Great, all right. Um, hello, my name is Devin. I live in Southwest Portland and I'm a high school senior. I'm going to read a portion of a testimony that was submitted on behalf of someone named Kay who was unable to be here today but submitted online written testimony. To Mayor, Mayor Ted Wheeler and the Portland City Council, my name is Kay, and I'm a Portland resident of 10 years. I work in Chinatown, a Portly, an area in Portland with, with a high homeless population compared to other areas. I'm one of the founding members of UWU, a trans and queer artist collective advocating for the rights and the safety of Black, Indigenous, Latinx, and Asian communities in the city. As a resident of Portland and as a community member advocating for, underserved, for the underserved people, I'd like to demand the following an immediate reduction in the taxpayer-funded Portland Police Bureau budget, a freeze on new PPD hires and an end to the violence of policing, beginning with the anti-gang policing unit, a rejection of policing on public transit and in schools, and the Portland City Council's investment in life-affirming solutions to Portland's needs by building up community-based and peer-led services and resources. Our community desperately needs a strong, an empathetic approach from the Portland City Council more than ever today and in our current pandemic state. My close black friends and their family members have been racially profiled by the Portland Police Bureau, some of them losing their beloved family members to police killings, others being put into the life and death situations on the sidewalk, on the max, on the bus, during their lunch break. The list goes on as their trauma continues. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your testimony. Next is River Foley. Good evening, River. Good evening. My name is River. I live in Lloyd District in Northeast Portland. Care Not Cops has the following demands for the city of Portland. Immediately scale back police presence in historically black neighborhoods, communities of color, and areas with high houseless populations in order to reduce the fear, ongoing trauma, violence and oppression, oppressive conditions which impede people's daily survival. End all new arrests. Release all people being held on pretrial in Multnomah County jails, along with those that have been serving misdemeanor sentences in those facilities and those being held on parole or probation violations or other warrants. Policing, prisons, and jails are vectors for the spread of COVID and have always been antithetical to public health. Develop and implement a plan to dismantle the gun violence reduction team, previously the gang enforcement team, to stop its well-documented practice of targeting black and brown people, particularly young people it has not stopped arbitrarily designating as gang members, despite, despite the claim that it has. Immediately reduce the Portland Police Bureau budget and reject the proposed increase of nearly $7 million over the last year's adopted budget. Invest in life-sustaining, dignified health and income support resources that will allow people to take social distancing measures to survive this pandemic and ultimately reduce people's vulnerability to targeting by police. Implement genuine strategies for dignified temporary and permanent housing, rent relief, and halt sweeps of houseless encampments and other villages. Include impacted and targeted communities at the forefront of determining city investments in life-sustaining resources and related policy objectives. We say, give us care, not cops. Thank you. 
And for those wondering how to testify uh, online, uh, if you're in the chat, you can see there's a link that's just been posted for online testimony. Next is Ava Smith. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh, my name is Ava Smith. I live in Northeast Portland and I work with a free lunch collective. Uh, my colleague Shannon earlier talked about what we do. We serve lunches three times a week to uh, um, currently about 190 is what we're hitting, um, but we're looking to up that soon. Um, I'm here to continue to demand that the city defund the gun violence reduction team. The proposed budget allocates over $6 million for this gang policing unit, which targets Portland's black communities and neighborhoods under heavy gentrification with traffic stops and street harassment. The city must not spend millions to fund a unit that functions on racial profiling and surveillance of black communities. As white supremacy dictates, we know that if you write off the narratives of those subject to this violence. So we point uh, to the audits released in 2018 by your own city auditor, which found among so much else that 59% of PPB's traffic stops in 2016 were black people, that PPB did not record why they were stopping them. Even if these numbers have lowered marginally since the report, Black Portlanders are still receiving constant police harassment and violence, and no amount of that is acceptable. We want to acknowledge and thank Commissioner Joe Ann Hardesey once again, thank you, Ann Hardesey, um, for advocating for the GVRT to be dismantled. Tonight's budget hearing also is being held at the same time as a 10-year memorial for Keaton Otis, who was murdered by the Portland Police Gun Violence Reduction Team after a racially profiled tra traffic stop. The City Council's choice to discuss allocating staggering amounts of violence of money to a very policing unit that murdered Keaton while the community mourns his death and celebrates his legacy is entirely disrespectful and calculated way to prevent many people most impacted from police violence from testifying. I'd like to use the rest of my mo of my time as a moment of silence for key notice. Time is up. Next individual, please, Carla. Is Michael DeSantis. Uh, thank you, uh, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners. My name is Michael DeSantis, and I serve as a public policy associate with Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. Uh, each year, EMO serves thousands of Portland residents through our eight direct service programs. Through our second home program, we empower unaccompanied houseless youth to complete their high school education by matching them with volunteer home providers. Uh, and I'm here today to invite the city to join us in supporting these youth by committing additional resources to meet their increased needs during the COVID-19 pandemic. This crisis poses a particular dangerous threat to youth experiencing homelessness. As many as three out of every four of these youth live with an underlying chronic medical condition, and their high level of mobility places them at an elevated risk for both contracting and also spreading the disease. Uh, experts agree that the pandemic will lead to an increased number of houseless youth. The crisis has forced many youth to self-isolate in abusive home situations, and more youth are choosing to leave home to protect their own safety. Even more youth will lose their housing due to the pandemic's economic fallout, similar to trends we witnessed during past downturns, such as the 2008 recession, when the number of houseless students in the U.S. rose by 50%. Even before the pandemic, Portland faced a youth houselessness crisis. Last year, PPS identified over 1,200 houseless students, one in six of whom were unaccompanied. We also know that our city has hundreds, if not thousands, more houseless youth who are no longer even in school uh, or have chosen to hide their housing status out of fear and shame. Disproportionate numbers of these youth are youth of color, queer identified, former foster youth, and survivors of physical and sexual abuse. EMO deeply appreciates that the proposed budget preserves current funding levels for the Joint Office of Homeless Services, despite widespread cuts in other areas. 
However, we believe it is imperative that resources be specifically allocated to services for youth because they face unique barriers to accessing services. Youth are ineligible to stay in local temporary shelters. Our partners at PPS have had difficulty connecting with students who are houseless. And service providers, such as our own second home program, have witnessed an increased demand for housing, food, and hygiene services. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. The next person is James Offsink. Welcome, James. Thank you. Can you hear me? Loud and clear. You're good to go. Awesome. Thanks. So my name is James Offsink. I live in the Richmond neighborhood. I'm a longtime advocate for good government and democracy. Um, and tonight I'm providing input in a personal capacity. I thank you, Mayor Wheeler and commissioners for listening to the community tonight and for the opportunity for me specifically to provide input. However, I am frustrated by just how limited the input is. Uh, first, I strongly believe that the budget is improved when there is robust public engagement because the best solutions come from community members. In fact, uh, last year's budget message, Mayor Wheeler indicated, uh, and I quote, that he was committed to creating a process that is more accessible and meaningful for all Portlanders. In addition to traditional town hall events, uh, and then he goes on to describe all of the public engagement opportunities last year and says, I look forward to trying new ways to engage the public in future bu budgets, and I will be creating more opportunities for Portlanders to voice, voice their budget priorities earlier in the process as we develop the, pro the budget for fiscal year 2021. So I've been disappointed to not see that uh, be followed through on. Um, instead of a robust public process, we had less than 30 hours to review a lengthy and complicated document reflecting hundreds of programs and dozens of bureaus that made significant changes in formatting from previous years, making it difficult to even independently baseline this year's numbers to our historical ones. Um, finally, on the process front, I do uh, think it's the wrong strategy to ask bureaus to independently in silos make their own cuts instead of um, the mayor and council deciding you know, strategically across all bureaus where it makes the most sense to be reflecting the city's values. So I wanna, you, moving on from the process uh, issues, I wanna uh, use the rest of my time to I think agree largely with much of the testimony that I've heard um, here tonight and I, uh, apologize, I, I've only been on for maybe the last 45 minutes, so I did miss the beginning of it. Um, but I do wanna just double down on that. Our police budget does not reflect uh, the values of our community, and specifically there are areas including the student resource officers that uh, students across the city have um, routinely rejected and demonstrated against. Thank you. Um, also, the gun violence reduction team and transit police uh, need serious reductions in future budgets. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Dan Manning. Mr. Manning, welcome. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Hi, my, well, my name's Dan Manning and I'm a 45 year resident homeowner of Southwest Portland. And I'd like to reiterate the comments of many previous participants and object to the current and proposed police budget. I don't want to continue living in a police state and I object to paying to do so. I would like to uh, see the police budget decreased and those funds used to further assist in the needs of the people of Portland that are in dire straits right now, especially homeless and poor people of color. So that's my comment. Thank you very much for taking it. Thank you. Thank you for being here, appreciate it. Next is Maggie Zabo. Hello, Maggie. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, um, yeah, my name is Maggie. Um, I'm a science student at PCC here representing Teresa Reifert's campaign for mayor of Portland and Care Not Cops. I am reading a continued portion of testimony to Matt of K, who was unable to be here today. 
Kay says, I've seen enough black houseless people in Chinatown being racially profiled by the police while other houseless people get by freely. In these situations, if I happen to be there, I record the interactions between the police officer and the houseless person in hopes to de-escalate the situation. More often than not, a police officer leaves the site after they see someone recording them. In these circumstances, houseless people are harmless and innocent, leaving the officer with no reason to harass them. Beyond this issue, the houseless communities are frequently put under the pressure of numerous houseless encampment sweeps, only putting them into further difficult living conditions while failing to tackle the core issue, protecting the poorest in our community. With above reasons, I would love to see the city of Portland immediately scale back police presence in historically black neighborhoods, communities of color, areas with high houseless populations in order to reduce the fear ongoing trauma, violence, and oppressive conditions in which impede people's daily survival. I would also love to see the city of Portland develop and implement a plan to dismantle the gun violence reduction team to stop its well-documented practice of targeting people of color in black and brown neighborhoods, and particularly of youth, especially as Portland has temporarily closed its schools. What is a nation which does not serve the most vulnerable with compassion? What is a state which puts a blind eye to those who experience state violence and live in fear? What is a city without empathy and progress? I would love to see the city of Portland prioritize the investment of community care, such as stable housing and health care for all, coming from empathy instead of investing farther into PPV, which frequently puts black people's lives at risk. Portland is one of the most progressive cities in the US after all. Let's lead the nation by being a good example. For the rest of the time, I would like to take a moment of silence for Katie Notis. Thank you. Thank you. Time is up. Thank you. Next in the control, please, Carla. Is Aria Jogan. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, welcome. Thank you. Um, my name is Aria Jokin, and I'm an educator and designer who was raised in outer Southeast Portland and currently live in the Gladstone neighborhood in Southeast. I'm here this evening because I believe that now, more than ever, we need to be prioritizing our public funding for the resources that keep our communities resilient and healthy. If there's two really important lessons to be learned from this current COVID-19 crisis, it's that all along, we as a city and as a society should have been investing in access to housing and health care for all people, and not continuing to dump millions more into the policing budget every year. Having safe and supportive shelter, medical support, and community-based mental health care are what truly create strong communities before, during, and after health crises. We cannot afford to continue on the same path that has caused violence for Black, Brown, and poor community members in our city. We cannot continue on the same path that has shuffled those same community members into prisons and jails. For that reason, I join Care.Cops in urging you to defund and end the gun violence reduction team, to reject the $7 million increase to the police budget, bureau budget, and to instead fund relief and resources that will allow our communities to thrive, both now and beyond the crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Kernan Willis. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, welcome, Frank. <laughs> thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for extending this time. Um, I appreciate that. I know it's late for everyone. Um, but my name is Kernan Willis, and I live in the Kenton neighborhood in North Portland. Um, I've been an elementary school teacher in Portland Public Schools, teaching in North Portland for the past eight years. Um, I've worked with many students, primarily black and brown children, who have been adversely affected by the Portland Police Bureau either because their parent or relatives were killed by the police, imprisoned and or harassed by the police. Um, I personally saw how this affected their mental health, their social connections, their ability to trust and their academic performance. Um, with schools out, I worry about an increase in targeting of black and brown youth specifically by the gun violence reduction team as it doesn't have a good track record. And this is not public safety, this is trauma. So during this global and regional pandemic, um, as you know, we need to take steps to reduce trauma, not increase it. Um, 
Portland Public Schools, as you know, we've elected to furlough ourselves for the remainder of the school year in an effort to save funding and teaching positions next year. This furlough means a reduction in mental health and academic supports currently, but the long-term effects will be beneficial. It's a drop in the bucket, but we're willing to do what we can to help our community. I urge that the Portland Police Bureau supports our community by divesting money from their already extreme budget um, especially by closing such uh, programs as the gun violence reduction team, SROs, and the transit police, um, and instead allocate this money to social services, as so many before me have said, small businesses, homeless supports, mental health supports, and education. We need to prioritize care and community building rather than increase trauma and punishment. Thank you. I'd like to take the rest of my time to have a moment of silence for Keaton Otis. Time is up. Thank you. Thank you. The next person is Nico Bartolski. Welcome. Hi, thanks. Hi, my name is Nico Bartolski and I live and work in North Portland. First, I want to again bring Keaton Otis's name into this space. Today is the 10-year memorial for Keaton Otis, who was killed by the Portland Police Gun Violence Reduction Team, formerly the Gang Enforcement Team. I'm also here to support the efforts and labor of the Care Not Cops organization. Um, to the point that other folks have made, any type of funding towards police, whether it be cost of living and or upgrading technology is still funding towards the police. The city of Portland needs to develop and implement a plan to dismantle the gun violence reduction team, implement genuine strategies for dignified temporary and permanent housing, rent relief and halt sweeps of houses encampments and other villages and also include impacted and targeted communities at the forefront of determining city investments and in life-sustaining resources and related policy objectives. This funding has to be invested in community programs such as increased housing, transformative justice models, and education. This is a non-exhaustive -exha list. As a community member who served Portland's most marginalized and vulnerable youth via a nonprofit, who I'm not representing today, it is alarming to see Mayor Wheeler simultaneously pushed for grant allocation through funding like the Portland Children's Levy to prioritize mentoring and education support services for black youth, and in the same breath proposed to increase funding towards policing. We know that police disproportionately and at alarmingly high rates target, arrest, harm, and murder black people. How can we say that we're invested in the future of black youth and at the same time invest in their death sentences at the hands of police officers? We do exactly this when we continue to fund and prioritize the PPB. Again, I can't stress enough the need to reduce the Portland Police Bureau budget and reject the proposed increase of nearly $7 million over last year's adopted budget. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing your perspective. Uh, excuse me, Mayor. Commissioner Hardesty. It may be worth it to repeat your opening statement. I believe some of our speakers are unaware of the budget cut that you have asked the police bureau to take. Um, I, I could, I'm not sure it's gonna have a material impact one way or the other, but the bottom line is uh, all bureaus, including the police bureau were directed to take a 5.6% reduction those bureaus that rely more heavily on the general fund will feel that more. Um, the police bureau is a heavily general fund dependent bureau. The increases that people are reflecting refer to an absolutely necessary technology improvement project. I don't think anybody has disputed the need for that project, as well as previously contractually negotiated COLA increases and the like so um the, the the increases that people are reflecting are those items D does that satisfy your need there commissioner uh thank you i you know i think it's always helpful when uh we uh repeat information that the public may not have heard so thank you Got it. yeah good thank you commissioner sorry carla go ahead next is sierra alberti Hi, can you hear me? 
Hi, my name is Sierra, and I live in the uh, Rocky Butte, North Portland area, and I am a graduate of PSU and a current legal assistant working in Southeast Portland, and I am going to read testimony submitted on behalf of someone named Emma, who was unable to be here today but submitted online written testimony. Hi, my name is Emma. I use they, them pronouns. I live in Portland, Oregon, and I'm a formal, former social worker and current organizer with Asians for Black Lives Portland and the C3PO project. I, like many others, am demanding that the city does not approve the proposed $7 million increase to the Portland city budget and instead defund the police to re or instead uh, defunds the police to reallocate funds to social services. I understand that some folks need the police as a resource that helps keep them safe. Often when I advocate to dismantle police and prisons, the first response I get is, well, who are you going to call if you experience an assault or a rape? Today, I'm choosing to speak to you, not as a social worker or as an organizer, but as a survivor of rape myself. And I wanna be clear, the police do not keep survivors safe. In fact, the police often re-traumatize the survivors by victim blaming, escalating situations of domestic violence, and coerce the survivors into punitive legal processes that are as emotionally violent as the assaults themselves. As an Asian queer femme with mental health struggle, struggles, I didn't even consider the police an option. I knew that at 19, that calling the cops would only expose me to more trauma, ridicule, and gaslighting. These predictions I made in my moment of crisis were later proven accurate for my peers who decided to go to the police for with their assaults just to be disbelieved and told they couldn't help. And if you're thinking, well, we just need to make the police more trauma-informed, you're missing the point. The police were intentionally built to control, scare, and punish criminalized communities, which consisted black and brown folk, houseless folk, and LGBTQIA2SQ folk. Not institution built with the intention of perpetuating more violence will ever be a safe or supportive option for survivors. Similarly, those who are the most vulnerable to experience sexual violence, black and indigenous women and femmes, houseless folks, trans folks are the exact communities that the police actively repress and criminalize. Safety for survivors is not this paternalistic savior response that is often violent as the harm itself. Safety is having access to food and housing and stability. Safety is having people who can provide ongoing emotional support and mental health support. Safety is having a community of people who are willing to educate and work with us when we harm or when we harm so we can unlearn our harmful behaviors. Safety is care, not cops. Thank you for the uh, council for hearing it. Thank you. Next is Olivia Hassenkamp. Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Olivia. I live in Southeast Portland. Um, I'm a nanny and I used to work as a dance teacher in an aftercare program. Um, I am giving this testimony to today, today to demand that city council use the proposed $245 million in the Portland Police Bureau budget, as many have already paid attention to, to invest in the people living in your city. I would like to remind the council that at each budget forum in the past few years, there have been hundreds of community members who show up to ask that their services like access to parks, community centers, and education not be cut. And we are told there is just not enough money. On top of that, this year, in the midst of a global pandemic that is disproportionately affecting Black communities, the mayor is proposing to spend hundreds of millions of dollars to harass, surveil, arrest, and kill those same people through policing. This is horrific and unacceptable. Mayor Ted Wheeler, you have heard from so many community members so many times by now, and it is time to start listening. People are asking you to fund life-affirming resources, and you continue to fund the opposite. To address your earlier comments, there still seems to be $206 million coming from the general fund for this year's police budget, which is still a $3 million increase coming from the general fund from last year, but it shouldn't be going to the, to the police, as many have already said. And Commissioner Hardesty, I want to thank you for your engagement in this process and your work to address policing in Portland. Thank police, you. 
will never be life affirming. No matter the amount of training and gadgets that attempt at holding them accountable, the institution of policing and prisons will still be rooted in capitalist white supremacy and will still treat human beings as disposable. Show us that you do care about us and invest in real community determined safety. We need care, not cops. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Next is Kevin Cherry. Hello, Kevin. Hi, can you hear me? Yep, loud and clear, good to go. Great, uh, good evening and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on the proposed budget. My name is Kevin Cherry. I am a resident of Northwest Portland and I am an instructor and PhD student of social policy in the School of Social Work at PSU. I speak in full agreement with the work of Care Not Cops and their demand for further reductions to the Portland Police Bureau budget. The message I would like to emphasize is simple, uh, which is that policing is not the best way to create safe and healthy communities. The city of Portland has shown a willingness to invest in the health and safety of our community through means other than policing by funding the Portland Street Response and the Cannabis Social Equity Grant programs. I applaud council's steps in this direction and encourage them to continue exploring and innovating with non-policing alternatives. The 2021 budget is an immediate and concrete opportunity to continue down this path. The 2021 budget is all the more important because of current global events. We do not yet know the full extent of economic, social, or health effects of the coronavirus pandemic, but emerging evidence suggests deep and long-standing negative impacts. If now is not the time to invest in life-affirming safety net resources and programs, when is? To conclude, I want to reiterate that policing is not the best way to create safe and healthy communities. The Police Bureau budget should be reduced. Budget reductions should be prioritized in the areas of transit policing, policing in public schools, and the gun violence reduction team. Funding from those areas should instead be directed to meaningful long-term solutions like accessible and affordable housing, healthcare, transportation, legal services, education, and efforts to mitigate climate change. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Thomas Karwaki. Good evening. Hello, um, commissioners. This is Tom Karwaki. I'm talking to you on terms of, uh, on behalf of the University of Park Neighborhood Association and NPNS uh, uh, chairs, the North Portland Neighborhood Services, uh, all the chairs of uh, that. Uh, we've been working together on a variety of things. This is dealing with homeless issues. Uh, number one, we were pro the PBOT uh, uh, lighting uh, Portland for safety, uh, for the street lighting. That's a big thing. And then the number two is dealing with the uh, whole issue of the uh, homeless. Um, we have a, a letter that's been sent to you um, with respect to all of these things that we're really in favor of a lot of the changes. And we support the uh, six million dollars of one-time funding, so that it's uh, kept whole for the joint office. But we'd really like to see some of the homeless issues uh, dealt with a little bit more closely, with uh, increased uh, portable toilets, hand washing stations, masks for COVID-19, hand sanitizers, etc., and a little bit more uh, managed self-governance and uh, some very specific transition services to permanent housing for all the residents. Um, so that's one of the, the areas that we've asked for, and you'll be getting that. I, I, that letter was sent to you guys uh, earlier uh, today. Um, we also support the Southwest Parks uh, testimony that you uh, heard earlier. Uh, it's uh, uh, really, that was very, very good. Uh, and we want to thank uh, Jessica Kinnard and the CBO staff for all of the work they've been doing on this project. So uh, I think it's a, a, a good budget in general, but uh, we're really concerned with the homeless issues. Uh, and make sure that the services are provided and um, they're taken care of uh, and not just swept away. So that's that's our concerns. Thank you for your testimony, Tom. Thank you. 
Next is Mary Pavito. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Mary Pivito. I'm Executive Director of Neighbors for Clean Air. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify regarding the proposed budget um, for Portland's fiscal year 2020 to 2021. I know you all have to make hard decisions about the city's resource allocation in the wake of contracting revenues due to the shutdown from COVID. And I wanna first say how much I appreciated our city's leadership to put public health first and make hard decisions to protect the well-being of our communities. Before this crisis hit our community, our global community was facing another critical crisis that continues to threaten public health and climate ecosystems. The global climate crisis still exists, though there are many signs of the efficacy of current emission reductions having immediate and beneficial impacts in our environment. So with that crisis in mind, which climate scientists have said will overwhelm us irreparably within 11 to 12 years, I'd like to have my testimony to support the inclusion of important investments in air quality and environmental initiatives, specifically the inclusion of adding a position to work on the city's green fleet transition um, to ensure continued progress on this top climate action and to fund the city contribution to the regional partnership to build a cleaner and greener construction industry. I want to remind folks the intersections that have been made more clear about public health and air quality and to urge our city leaders to invest strongly to protect the air. A nationwide study conducted recently about the spread of COVID-19 documented that when looking at the tens of thousands of American deaths, many of the pre-existing conditions that increase the risk of death in those with COVID-19 are the same diseases that are affected by long-term exposure to air pollution. We are seeing this manifest itself in Portland as well. Recently, last week, Oregon Health Authority released data that shows many of the communities that we know experience the highest exposure to diesel exhaust are experiencing the highest rates of COVID-19 infections. Reducing diesel particulates from construction activity, the largest contributing sector to the most deadly air toxins, Portland air and cleaning up the fleets should be among our top public health priorities to protect our most vulnerable populations. And so thank you for your attention to this in the budget. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Next is James Posey. Welcome, Mr. Posey. <laughs> Mr. Posey, uh, we cannot hear you. Are you on? Can you hear me now? Yeah, we sure can. Thank you. Well, okay, well, thank you. Um, you know, what would be helpful by way of process is you could have a list of uh, where you stand in the queue for making these comments. But um, that said, I would just like to um, say I'm concerned about the auditor's office. You know, Mary has been, um, I think, a trooper in terms of uh, kind of work she's been trying to do in terms of being a reflection of what the community would like to see in terms of accountability. And it concerns me greatly that uh, we are having continual issue, issues with her having enough resources to do her job. She's probably the only independent uh, nonpartisan person that you can actually rely on for, for data and information. So I'm simply uh, on here to talk about uh, making sure that you all recognize how valuable the auditor's office is. And it distresses me to see you all are haggling over just a few dollars when, it, when in fact, if you fully fund her, she would be uh, a tremendous asset in terms of knowing whether all you all's priorities are really being uh, met uh, efficiently, effectively, and we're really reaching uh, where we need to go with these resources. So uh, with that said, uh, uh, I want other folks to know that your auditor's office needs your support and she doesn't need to be hassled. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Posey. And, and just to clarify, um, th this is more than a tough conversation about resources. It also has to do with what you just described, independence. And uh, there is no ill will aimed at the auditor here. We have a legitimate uh, uh, charter question and the question really is this from from my perspective i won't speak for my colleagues we have the independent hearings office and when people file a complaint 
against a city bureau, that independent hearings officer hears the complaint and they are to judge impartially. And it is very important that they be perceived as being completely independent and impartial from the bureaus that are being uh, judged, if you will, in this process. And the auditor is correct that she has been taking on this function since the 1990s at um, the request of the city council that she could, in fact, say she's no longer interested. She has said she's no longer interested, but the problem then becomes, where do you put the independent hearings office? Uh, if you put it, for example, in my portfolio, and there's an independent hearing about one of the bureaus that I'm the commissioner in charge of, right away you have the, you know, people will immediately say if the hearing does not go their way, that it was anything but impartial because the hearings officer um, is engaged with the bureaus that they're in fact serving in a, a, a role as judge. So we, we're, we're not trying to create any animus with the auditor. We want to find an amicable and responsible solution to this issue. Uh, we worked with the auditor in prior years to expand her independence uh, relative to the Portland City Council. I worked with her personally on some budget issues in the last couple of budget cycles. Um, so we, we have a disagreement about funding over the hearings office. Um, but, and, but I would just tell you, Mr. Posey, I wish it was that simple, uh, but unfortunately there's more complicated issues here around true independence. And, uh, Mr. and Mayor, I, people I, can disagree. Yeah, Mr. Mayor, I, I didn't read that uh, in communication from uh, Mary. Uh, she, I appeared, she appeared to uh, convey that she's very willing to uh, retain the uh, hearings officer's uh, position in her office, but she's being squeezed because you all, city council, are not willing to pay appropriately for uh, paying for those services. And uh, it was just very detailed. You know, you got a very Okay, well, it, it, woman it, in the office. Okay, we, so, we, excuse we, me, Mayor, if we, I may. What, one moment. I, mean, Sorry, we, I have my hand up. Yeah, no, Commissioner Fritz will go first. Uh, and, and I don't want to belabor this, and Mr. Posey, I, I hear your larger point, and mm -hmm. I don't disagree with it. Um, however, um, nobody's getting the funding they want in this budget. We have a massive budget short. All of our bureaus are making sacrifices, as I indicated previously, uh, in you know, my office, me personally, um, so we disagree on the numbers, but if we can work something out over the course of the next year to we see the Turner Review Commission, and then the Turner Review Commission can help us work out a reasonable solution. Commissioner Fritz, then Commissioner Hardesty. Well, first of all, Mr. Posey, it's great to hear your voice. I wish I could see you as well. And um, secondly, just to be, um, add, add what the mayor said, the auditor's office routinely has hundreds of thousands of excess dollars that they return to the general fund at the end of the year. I believe the expected surplus this year is in the region of $500,000. So to say that um, we are squeezing the budget and not giving her adequate resources it is not borne out by the evidence. Yeah, I just want to say she explains that quite uh, um, directly, that those dollars are for audit services and uh, uh, she explains why those dollars were retained. And uh, she, see, she sees that you all are penalizing her for being effective and efficient, efficient and making the cuts that you all uh, addressed, uh, uh, asked her to make. But uh, the hearings officer's position is clearly not funded at the level that it should be. And for you all to suggest that uh, uh, she is, uh, has enough dollars to, uh, to move those dollars over into the hearings office position, that's just wrong, and that's not how we do business, and you all know that. Well, actually, that is how we do business, with all due respect, that we um, reallocate funding from uh, certain some bureaus' parts to others, and the council would certainly approve a request to do that. Okay. Well, look, we're, 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 I don't think anybody's interested in us having a prolonged discussion over this particular issue, but we'll, we'll work it out over the course of the next year. We'll let the Charter Commission, the Review Commission weigh in. 
uh, and hopefully we'll find a solution that moves the ball forward for everyone. Commissioner Hardesty, did you have a comment on this? Um, I just merely wanted to say that uh, I agree with you, Mayor. The Charter Review Commission will ultimately uh, send a question to the voters about whether elected leaders can pick and choose what they will and won't do. Uh, there's an obligation that comes with that office. It was there long before the current auditor got there, and it will be there long after she leaves. So uh, I, I, I think we'll wait and see what the Charter Review Commission decides. And, and we are also looking at some alternative models as well. So to, to be continued. Thank you, Mr. Posey, for raising it. Commissioner Daly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just wanted to jump in. Uh, you muted again, Commissioner Daly. Oh, wait, what happened? It froze. Yeah, she's just froze. She's not muted. <laughs> oh, okay. Can you try again, Commissioner Daly? It'd be a moral document, but it's also a document of compromise. So I haven't uh, succeeded, but I just don't want to be lumped in um, in the in the way that Mr. Posey has described it. All right, thank you. We, we got most of that, Commissioner U. Daly. Thank you. Uh, Carla, next individual, please. Next is Diane Meisenhelder. Welcome, Diane. Diane, are you able to connect? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, we, now. <laughs> oh my. And a whole lot of other stuff. Okay, okay. I'm gonna hold it down here. So I received the budget notice entitled Building a Resilient Portland. Yet when I opened the budget, saw something quite different from what was lauded. I was dismayed by the proposal to increase the Portland Bureau budget by seven million in general funds. We should, especially in a pandemic, be decreasing arrests and the numbers of in jails and decreasing fear, trauma, violence, and the experience of those most vulnerable being subjected to sweeps, unjust profiling, and targeting. Given that the houseless are a large, disproportionate part of a Portland arrest, often for offenses, we must reduce leasing and using resources for temporary and permanent housing with supportive services and addressing mental and physical health. At a time of massive unemployment, we need to create jobs, building the infrastructure for a regenerative decarbonized economy and restoring the environment to mitigate against future climate and pandemic crises. We need to, we need to decrease transportation and other emissions to reduce respiratory risk factors. We need to hire those in need to create housing, housing and care for others in need. We need, we need a transformative economy based on, based different, on metrics. different metrics, including sustainability and healthy lives where the, hmm. Thank you. Or should I keep going or I, it, I was muted, it said. Oh, um, yeah, go, go ahead. Sorry. I, I thought you had completed your comments. No, 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 no. We need a transformative economy based on different metrics, including sustainability and healthy lives, where the needs of people and planet are prioritized over profit and policing. This is the basis of a resilient Portland, not yet reflected in a budget where planning and sustainability in the Office of Equity see decreases, scarce funds are set aside for an unadvisable rose festival during COVID. And I, per I personally have some concerns about CARES fund funds being funneled through Prosper Portland. As the inequities and failures of our current systems become even more painfully obvious, during this emergency, there is both the need, the opportunity, and moral obligation for visionary leadership to shift funds in bold and meaningful ways towards a caring, sustainable economy. Please, please act accordingly. Sorry for the echoing early on. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Okay. Next is Christine Nielsen. Welcome, Christine. 
Good evening, Mayor and Commissioners. I'm Christine Nielsen. I wish to make known my objection to adoption of the portion of the City of Portland FY 2021 budget that nullifies the independence of the City of Portland's independent auditor and po potentially impacts the effectiveness of that often office. The tasks of the auditor's office are spelled out in the charter. No elected official or bureau administrator may assign additional work to the auditor without the consent of the auditor. This protects the ability of the auditor to do the work they are elected to do, and this must be respected. Assignment of an underfunded hearings office to the auditor without consent is an egregious example of disrespect and undermining of the work of the auditor's office. For our city of Portland government to perform most effectively and efficiently, audits are necessary and valuable, coming as they do with a clear delineation of areas of concern and steps towards correction. Elected officials in charge of audited bureaus may at once welcome and despise the audit because it may bring public note to their bureaus functioning for better or worse. It makes no sense for you as elected officials to have line item and ultimate approval of the auditor's budget. This puts each of you at risk of conflict of interest or a perception of conflict of interest. That cannot be rectified this year, but must be a priority. Each of you should want that. For now, I call on you to adequately fund the hearings office in order that it can conduct the oversight required and house it in a mutually agreeable setting. To do other than this is to compromise the hearings office and the auditor's office. Fund the auditor's office adequately to conduct the work it is required to do. Create the independence the independent auditor must have. Time is up. A budgeting process for FY2122 that is not subject to alteration by the council. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. And as we uh, go through the charter review process, your input on this would be super helpful. These are important issues you're raising. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you. Next is Wendy Rom. Hi, Wendy. Wendy, are you there? There she is. Can you hear me? Yeah. I'm, mu I'm muted by the host, it says. Oh, now I'm not. Okay. Sorry. Um, I'm Wendy Rom, and I live in the West End. Uh, and thank you for uh, taking my testimony. Not long ago, we worked to ensure independence and equal standing for the citywide elected auditor. Uh, yet your budget proposal undercuts voter approved intentions. The 2017 voter approved charter amendments promote an auditor's budget based on auditor priorities, improving the prospect of her budget being based on auditor responsibilities rather than council priorities. The charter states the auditor may be assigned duties by council with the consent of the auditor. The auditor's unsuccessful attempts over time to get council to relocate the underfunded but important hearings office agreed to in the 90s is now a burden on the overcommitted auditor budget. The hearings office is not an auditor duty per city charter. Repeated requests to find another home for this office have been ignored and the auditor withdrew consent. The city budget still ignores the relocation request. Instead, by including minimal funds for it in the auditor's budget, council is mandating without consent a duty to the auditor not in charter and ensures the hearing office is not properly staffed. This charter violation by council interference threatens the auditor's independence. Delete the budget and duties of the hearings office from the auditor's budget, please. The hearings office must be independent of bureaus where it provides oversight. The auditor's office is not the only option. Without full funding, it can't perform this oversight. How can it possibly be a check on city power under these conditions? Full funding and enabling its independence must be addressed separately from the auditor's budget. 
We want transparency and accountability. I endorse the proposed pilot framework for setting the audit auditor's budget. Structural change is needed. The pilot removes council control and built-in conflicts of interest over line item decisions Time is up. for auditor priorities and supports her independence stipulated by charter. Council facing hard financial times, so prioritize the budget pilot when you can. Um, approve the auditor's proposed budget with, with the pilot uh, and move the fund, the hearing office if possible. Thank you, Wendy. Appreciate your testimony. Next is James Roberts. James, welcome. Okay, hi, my name is James Roberts. Uh, I live in Northeast Portland. I'm a staff attorney at Catholic Charities and one of the Equity Corps of Oregon direct service attorneys. I'm speaking in favor of continued funding of the Universal Representation Program for immigrants and removal proceedings. Uh, I believe some of my colleagues are also speaking tonight, uh, so I'll be brief. Uh, you know, Catholic Charities, we've already have had two clients um, that have had their hearings postponed because of the pandemic. If the delays continue into June, we'll have at least three more. Uh, these hearings will actually be rescheduled as far in the future as 2022 or 2023. Affected Catholic Charities clients include torture victims, victims of uh, oppressive police violence in their home countries, children fleeing gang violence, uh, and women fleeing um, you know, just really extreme domestic violence. Uh, if the ECHO program does not continue beyond its current funding, some of those clients will likely end up without representation, uh, be left to navigate immigration court without representation. Uh, one of my Portland clients who's hearing will likely be postponed, comes from Central America. He has already been, he's been repeatedly illegally detained by the police in his home country, beaten and threatened for participating in protests. He has a wife and children at home. Uh, he won't be able to apply for them to come here until his case is heard, uh, which, you know, could end up being two or three years uh, later now. You know, the COVID-19 crisis has already disproportionately hurt immigrants and asylum seekers. You know, we're already seeing at the border the pandemic being used as a reason to block some asylum seekers from entering the country, including people fleeing torture, police violence, gang violence, and domestic violence. You know, many immigrants are essential workers and play a crucial role in the economy and will continue to do so as we you know, rebuild. Uh, you know, continuing to provide representation to immigrants and to asylum seekers in immigration courts uh, here in Portland is therefore you know, vitally important uh, at this time. All right, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. Next is Paloma Norris York. My name is Paloma Norris York. I am an attorney with Metropolitan Public Defenders Community Law Program, which, among other services, helps undocumented Portlanders through the Equity Corps program. My clients fled extremely violent situations to seek asylum in this country. They are now contributing members of the city of Portland. They work at restaurants, clean offices, hospitals, and hotels, and several are high school students with bright futures in this country if they are represented in their immigration cases. Many are now under or unemployed because of COVID and need to put all of their wages to supporting their families and stimulating our economy. Providing legal services to these neighbors allows them access to legal representation they could never afford and improves their ability to fully present their asylum cases. Many undocumented community members came to this country as small children and now serve our community as teachers, doctors, and social workers through the DACA program. Already DACA has stopped for new applicants and now those who currently can work and attend college because of DACA are at risk mm -hmm. of losing that protection. Equity Corps can provide them with legal representation through the Universal Representation Program to help them navigate the unjust immigration system. Mm -hmm. Our economy and society benefit from keeping asylum seekers in our community, and an investment in the Universal Representation Program is an investment in our city's future. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Britt Conroy. Welcome, Britt. Britt, 
Britt, are you with us? Carla, why don't you move on to the next individual? We'll try Britt again. Okay, um, get another name here. Uh, Thank you. James, I'm sorry, James Offsink. Uh, didn't James testify earlier? He or spoke, like? yeah, he spoke earlier. Yeah. I believe that was another off sync, wasn't it? No. Nope. Oh. Now unless she's got a twin brother with the same name. What was it? Oh, yep, looks like it was, sorry. Okay, she's, okay. Getting, she's getting me another name here. Okay, and Britt, you're still <laughs> not on, are you? I still know Britt. Yeah, why don't you get a different name, Carla? Okay, she's, she's bringing one up and you're just... I think we already had that one too, Alexandra. Dan Manning. Uh, Theodora Linehan. Welcome, Theodora. Are you on? Huh. No. Carla, why don't you go to the next one? Uh, okay. Uh, we've uh, got Amy, Amy Adams. Amy Adams, are you here? Hi, can you hear me? Loud and clear. Oh, great. Um, good evening. I live in Southeast Portland and I am the removal defense attorney at SOAR Immigration Legal Services. Um, which is a program of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. I also provide legal services to immigrants at risk of deportation through the Equity Core program. Uh, first, I would like to thank the mayor and the commissioners for their support of Equity Core. On nearly a weekly basis, Equity Core clients tell me how important this program is to helping them feel safe and welcome in Portland. Through Equity Core, the city of Portland is affirming its commitment to remain a sanctuary city. The importance of this program cannot be overstated. Despite a worldwide pandemic, uh, Trump's deportation machine continues to target our most vulnerable community members. Undocumented community members are still being taken into ICE custody despite their increased risk of contracting COVID-19 in detention. Equity court clients are still expected to meet strict deadlines and to move forward with their deportation cases with the Portland Immigration Court. In response to the pandemic, Equity Corps immediately shifted to remote services to continue to help people file for asylum, prepare for their hearings, and inform asylum seekers of the important changes to their cases due to COVID-19. The clients who I serve through Equity Corps are vital to our city's prosperity. Trump recently designated undocumented farm workers as essential workers, even while they live in fear of constant deportation. Equity Corps plays an important role in helping undocumented folks know their rights, access services, and fight the deportation machine. We also help undocumented immigrants apply for work permits so that they can support their families and contribute to our economy. We help this community attain safety and self-sufficiency. Deportation causes not only unspeakable pain to immigrant families, but is also fiscally costly. Families lose 90% of their income after a family member is deported, which causes the remaining family members to rely on state and city sponsored services. And deportation also I puts um, I ask you to please continue to support Equity Corps. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate it. Next, I believe we're gonna try Theodora Linehan again. Hello, can you hello. hear me? Yep, loud and clear. Fantastic. Uh, hello, my name is Theodora Lenahan and I'm an immigration attorney with uh, Equity Corps. And like my colleagues and my, like my other colleagues in this program, I and Daphne Alza, community navigator, have been working throughout this health crisis to help Portland's immigrant communities. Some of our clients have lived in the city for decades and raised children here but they are now struggling with joblessness and housing instability. 
but because of their immigration status, they do not know who to turn to for help. There are many people in the city who fear that speaking to the wrong person or signing up at the wrong website will lead directly to a deportation order for themselves or a beloved family member. The fact is that many of them also do not qualify for the same resources that we can due to their status. We've been working to connect these families with resources like food pay on how to sign up for unemployment benefits, advising clients in mixed status households on how to obtain stimulus payments, and helping clients who are victims of domestic violence to navigate the IRS portal to change their addresses. I've helped clients write letters to their landlords to explain why uh, his reduced wages due to COVID-19 um, will affect his ability to pay and help protect him and his family from eviction. There is so much misunderstanding, fear, and anxiety at this time. And this Equity Corps program is providing more than just much needed legal help to underserved communities. We're able to share information with clients and help connect them with resources while assuring them that they aren't alone in this. Last week, uh, while I helped a client help complete and file her asylum application remotely, while she self-quarantined with her young fevered son, I had a chance to give much needed support to another human being that was feeling totally isolated and incapable of seeking the help that she needed. I'm so, so glad that we continue to do this work and I hope that we will be able to continue to help the people of Portland in future. Thank you. Thank you, appreciate your testimony. Next up is Emery Mort. Hello, Emery. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. All right, getting my speech pulled up. Hello and good evening. My name is Emery Mort and I live in North Portland, speaking for myself. I've been following local and national budgets closely and have attended many meetings and events to approach this important budget process with integrity. As we can see, even basic questions like, did this budget go up or down and why are still being communicated with a week to go before a critical budget is approved. This is disappointing. From city to city, even economic forecasters are in disagreement about whether federal money will be available for municipal budget shortfalls. Given great societal uncertainties, real conversations need to be had now more than ever. I'll focus on policing, which I've invested significant time in studying, including policing budgets. I'll offer specific observations and recommendations about how police cuts can happen. In general, Budget savings and public safety can be achieved by cutting aspects of the police's roughly quarter billion dollar annual budget. Last year, for example, the Portland police had $33 million budgeted for quote, strategy and finance. I was curious to see what that number was this year and to understand what kind of strategy and finance the police needed that justified $100,000 a day in spending. But this year's budget has different categories, so one can't compare, making rapid budget analysis even more difficult despite the efforts. Another budget item is PPB use of overtime. The mayor's proposal says the city is facing 9 million in cuts and is asking union workers to take furloughs or get laid off. Uh, for comparison, police use about 15 million in overtime per year. Well, is that overtime well managed? I attended the auditor's report on PPB use of overtime, and it turns out that the answer is unequivocally no. SROs, do PPS students have a say on armed school resource officers in their schools and classrooms? I'll say my opinion, which is that SRO's $4 million budget should be cut and safety achieved through more effective means. The gun violence uh, reduction team. If long-term violence reductions are the aim, new national research shows Portland is wasting 6 million per year on this unit that sees itself above the law, including the recent Oregon law attempting to restrain them from unwarranted searches and questioning. PS3s, the I'm implementation of... Well, I was gonna to touch on PS3s and transit safety, which others have touched on. Thank you all those to uh, who are listening and I encourage, I encourage further open and creative conversations on these important and often life or death topics. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. I believe we're gonna try Britt Conroy. Britt, you there? Hello, Britt. Still no Britt, Carla. Okay, let's go with um, Esperanza from EPHC. All right, Esperanza. Hi, 
Hi, my name is Esperanza Tapia. I am an immigration legal navigator at El Programa Hispano Católico, better known as EPHC. EPHC is one of four community-based organizations alongside ERCO, Latino Network, and Pueblo Unido that provide immigration legal navigations connecting people to Equity Corps, which offers free immigration legal representation for low-income individuals and families actively facing deportation. As immigration legal navigators, we not only provide wraparound, trauma-informed, and culturally specific referrals and services like housing, employment, tax, mental health, domestic, and sexual violence services, we also connect people to immigration legal representation while actively in deportation proceedings. We have been following Portland's COVID-19 guidelines while still navigating families into ECHO. I have been navigating families into the ECHO program by conducting the interviews over the phone and practicing social distancing and gathering documents. Although many have had their court hearings postponed due to COVID-19, those with filing deadlines are still expected to submit their applications on time and are given no leniency. I have had many families reach out to me asking where they can find assistance for housing and food because they have lost their job and do not qualify for unemployment or the CARES Act. Because of this, we've had a steep increase for the need for free legal representation during COVID-19. The clients I serve are some of the most resilient individuals I have ever had the pleasure of working with. They have overcome unimaginable obstacles to escape life-threatening situations. They bring a unique and inspiring presence to everyone around them. One of my final questions when doing a navigation is, what do you want the attorney that will be matched with you to know? One of the most recent response I got that really stuck with me. They said, all I want is a fighting chance for my family and I. I just want an attorney that will really listen to our story and fight right next to us. Every officer and immigration official we have been in contact with until this point have done nothing but make us feel unimportant and small. They have not listened to us. They don't even think of us as people. I was able to confidently tell him that ECHO does exactly that. I'm I urge you all to keep continuing fighting and supporting Portlanders obtain free immigration legal representation by continuing to support Equity Four. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Isaac Alley. Welcome, Isaac. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. All right, thank you, uh, Mayor and members of the commissioners. Thank you for giving me this time to speak with you today. Uh, my name is Isaac. I am the managing attorney at the Immigration Counseling Service, or ICS, and we are headquartered in downtown Portland. ICS has been providing uh, legal services to low-income immigrants, members of our community, for over 40 years now. Um, we're also a proud member of the Equity Corps program, which is among the nation's first statewide publicly funded uh, public defender programs for immigrants facing deportation proceedings. And I also feel the city of Portland should be proud too, as Portland provided much of the initial funding for the program and really enabled it to come into existence. Um, in the strongest terms, I'd urge the city to continue funding our program for several reasons, but I'd like to highlight two today. Uh, the first is that deport pro deportation proceedings are continuing as we speak, even if much of the immigration system is ground to a halt. The federal government has unfortunately elected to continue prosecutory actions against immigrants, despite the fact that we're beset by a pandemic. Um, and while Equity Corps stands ready to ensure that all immigrants receive a full and fair hearing, having gone statewide, we are very stretched in trying to represent every person in our state who needs representation at the immigration court. Um, second, the pandemic um, has decimated the employment and health of immigrant members of our community. Um, I think the Oregonian recently had an article about this, about how immigrants have been disproportionately affected on both counts. And because they're facing mass unemployment and a health crisis, um, they are losing um, their ability to pay for legal representation. Um, so as a result, our services are going to become more necessary as less people are able to afford uh, private representation, particularly when they're facing deportation back to situations that often involve torture and other severe forms of harm. Um, so for those reasons, I would urge the council to uh, vote to continue funding for Equity Corps. Um, and I think this would give us the wherewithal to continue to support the immigrant members of our community who are living on the margins, providing for us all um, during this time of crisis, and also just upholding Portland's basic commitment to due process. Uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Isaac. Next is Anderson D. Dubois III. Welcome, Anderson. Thank you. This is Anderson Dubois, the Youth Direct Services Manager for REAP Incorporated a local youth 
nonprofit organization that emphasizes youth voice. We run various youth programs in the school districts in the Portland Public School District, as well as David Douglas and Centennial Districts. I would really like to echo a lot of what was said around uh, with the other committee members, the other public comment. And I would like to say that it's very important that seeing this budget coming out, that we honor the relationships through all this. At the end of the day, uh, where this money is going to and how it's going to affect our city uh, really comes down to the partnerships that we hold. I'd like to shout out and thank Portland Children's Levy for funding us as well as the city. I know it is not easy to pre preside over these budgets this year. However, as I was saying, how we partner with each other is very important. Knowing that the police is getting a budget towards computers, maybe some of that uh, time using those computers can interact with youth in building relationships online in order to uh, protect our youth over the summer as they will not be in school. I know organizations like mine with REAP, with uh, SEI and so many other community organizations are engaging with students and our youth in the communities, uh, throwing events out like our Black Fatherhood Project, which is coming up May 21st, talking about Black males and fatherhood in the community to have various community leaders to be a part of that discussion, hearing in and hearing what folks have to say uh, is really important. And I think we'll go a long ways. I think that we should um, really remember folks like Otis uh, Keaton, Keaton Otis, and the lives that are being lost throughout all this and really honor the relationships that we have Time with is this up. funding because it's not just affecting this COVID outbreak, but even after. And uh, uh, we thank you for everything that you guys are doing now. Thanks, Anderson, appreciate it. Next is Ethan Livermore. Welcome, Ethan. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ethan Livermore, and I'm the Public Policy Advocate and Program Fundraising Coordinator with the Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon. Um, and I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak. I would like to tell you about one of our direct service programs called the Daily Bread Express. It provides in-home meal deliveries for low-income people living with HIV and AIDS, which severely compromises their immune systems. Seven nutritious meals are delivered weekly throughout the, throughout the Portland metropolitan area. The only requirements to participate in the program are that the meal recipients are HIV positive, have incomes below 300% of the federal poverty level, and I have a specified medical need for home deliveries of meals. Clients need to be referred by a case manager, and there is no fee for this service. In addition to preparing and delivering these meals, EMO's food services team is now preparing packaged meals to distribute to our clients of our HIV day center. The number of meals provided by EMO's food services has doubled from 2,000 meals to 4,000 meals per month. EMO and programs like it need funding to increase capacity for staff, kitchen equipment, and packaging materials. In these serious and concerning times, we need not just community support, but the support of our city's decision makers to help care for those living on the margins. We urge your support for nonprofits who are serving those in need. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Yasmin Ibarra. Excuse me, uh, can I ask how many other people are on the list? I am looking at the clock is 8.54. I just wanna know if we need to extend the time or not. I think we have about four people left after Yasmin, Commissioner Hardesty. Is that right, Carla? Um, the list I'm showing, I, I see about one more, but I'll let Alexandra correct me. Okay, Thank it's just a small yeah. handful. Right, it's just a, a couple more at the most, I believe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Yasmin? Good evening. Hi, everyone. My name is Yasmin. I'm the political organizer for SEIU Local 49. We represent the subcontracted janitor, security officers, and laundry workers for the city of Portland. And I've submitted my written testimony with more details, but I'm just going to highlight um, a little bit about what I submitted. 
We applaud uh, the mayor's focus on supporting frontline communities who have been hit first and worst in crafting this budget and further call on the city to ensure that the budget includes sufficient funding for enhanced essential cleaning and security services that will be disproportionately provided by people of color to safely reopen city buildings and public spaces. Much higher sanitation standards will be needed for janitors to clean services using appropriate chemicals and equipment. Security officers secure city space, spaces regardless of whether they're vacant or in use, and they may need to help with the pat with help. They may need to help the public navigate changes such as temperature checks or more restrictive public spaces. But these higher standards must not come at. Um, must not result in unreasonable workloads for our members. Contractors will need to increase staff to meet these new requirements. Uh, the city must also allocate sufficient funding to provide essential workers with desperately needed PPE and training on how to properly use it. And we know that Portland's janitorial security and laundry workforce is primarily complies, comprised of Black, Latinx, and Asian workers whose families and communities have been hit have been hit hardest by the COVID-19 as a result of our region's legacy of racism and white supremacy. Many workers from these communities have essential but low paying jobs where they're unable to work from home and do not have access to affordable health care, exposing them to greater risk of infection and severe complications from the virus. These workers deserve pay and benefits reflective of the vital services they provide and assurance of additional paid sick days should they or their families become ill with the virus as a result of performing their essential work. The city currently invests and benefits from uh, responsible union contractors for cleaning and security services. And while COVID-19 has, has a catastrophic impact on the public budget, we just urge the city to increase its investment in, this, in these responsible contractors. Thank you. And Carla, did we get a final count? Uh, we have four more. Okay, uh, colleagues, are you okay to stay till about a quarter after? Yes, Mayor. Commissioner Fritz, Commissioner Daly, are you okay with that? Sorry, I was, uh, yes, I'm able to stay. Thank you. Okay, yeah, we just got a few more people. I'm good. Thanks, Commissioner Daly. All right, Carla, let's keep going. Sure. Next is Ricardo Luan Valerio. Welcome, Ricardo. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler, uh, members of the council. For the record, my name is Ricardo Lujan Valerio. I'm the director of advocacy with Latino Network. Um, as the mayor stated during his introduction, the pandemic has amplified kind of the inequities that we've known existing uh, within our systems, specifically hitting undocumented Portlanders. And for that reason, there was a subcommittee from the mayor's tax force made for uh, addressing that specific issue of uh, undocumented Portlanders affected by COVID-19. Now, throughout the, the meetings with the committee, there was a charge by, by the group to be able to analyze the best way to support this population in the city. Um, I've submitted the final report by the committee to the record, uh, but I just want to highlight a few things. Um, there were three main recommendations that came out of this proposal. The first one being that um, we want to make sure that the city continues to advocate in the statewide level for the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, which has been a system set up by community-based organizations to specifically address this issue of undocumented individuals being financially affected by COVID-19. The second request um, is to uh, provide funding specifically for the Oregon Worker Relief Fund by the city. Um, we thank uh, Commissioner Udaley, uh, members of her staff, um, also uh, the mayor's office and uh, SNA and uh, Commissioner Hardesty's office on providing uh, what is currently outlined in the proposal. The submitted recommendation that I put on the record also provides the uh, complete impact that we estimate in the city of Portland and in the metro area, which highlight the bigger need uh, for this specific fund. So I, I um, encourage members of the council to really look into the submitted document. And then the last uh, recommendation is uh, support for businesses and micro and uh, entrepreneurs that are uh, immigrant based, um, that are owned by immigrants, and in some cases, undocumented immigrants. Um, most of them, uh, if not all of them, don't qualify for PPP and definitely re uh, require assistance by the city where it's needed. Um, I urge the council to really look at other mechanisms in order to continue to uh, provide uh, services for small businesses and micro entrepreneurs um, that are uh, immigrant based and owned by immigrants. Um, and then lastly, as a member of Latino Network and Equity Corps, I would be remiss if I didn't uplift uh, the voices of um, our colleagues that uh, raised the need 
for universal representation. As a doctor, that- myself, um, the fear about uh, DACA being uh, removed is, is real. So I thank you all for this. Thank you very much. Appreciate your testimony. Next is Rory Elliott. Welcome. Hello. Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Hello, Mayor and City Commissioners. I'm testifying tonight on the behalf of Care Not Cops to ask the City Council to deny any proposed increase from the Mayor to the Portland Police Bureau. I've heard Ted Wheeler say that all bureaus are experiencing budget cuts, and I hear that this is an unfortunate aspect of the moment gripped by COVID-19. In regards to the Police Bureau budget, which sits currently at around $240 million, the City Council and Ted Wheeler should be looking here as a way to keep the rest of the city's funding afloat. Rather than asking all bureaus, many of them life-affirming, to carry the burden of budget cuts, this inherently racist and violent arm of white supremacy, which takes up nearly 34% of the general fund, should carry all of the burden of needed budget cuts for the city. This may just make up for our current budget shortfall, but it would only be a small step towards making up for years of caging and criminalizing Portlanders. Defunding policing and investing in people is possible. We have seen cities across the country successfully reduce the police budget, shut down toxic prisons and jails, and fund and raise self-determination by bringing their voices to meetings very much like this one tonight. This redirection of funding looks like affordable housing. It looks like plans to permanently house our communities that struggle with housing insecurity. This looks like offering more equitable and accessible food programs. This looks like rent and mortgage relief now in COVID-19. This redirection could look like free public transportation, affordable health care, affordable mental health care, free COVID-19 testings, and free addiction support. This, the money is there, and $240 million of it is actually tied up into the violence of policing. We've been coming to you for years saying this exact same thing. What funding policing looks like is the well-documented practice of systematically targeting communities of color. It looks like violently enforcing social distancing guidelines. It looks like committing heinous acts of violence to black and brown communities. It looks like the fact that in 2016, more than half of is up we're black people in our city. It looks like gentrification. And I call on y'all to please defund the police and invest in our communities. It is possible and you can do it. Thank you. Thank you. The last person is Adriana Miranda. Welcome, Adriana. Oh, you got your own applause with you. Mayor Wheeler, Commissioners Fritz, Fideli, and Harnesty. I'm Adriana Miranda, the Executive Director of CAUSA. CAUSA is an immigrant rights organization that works to improve the lives of Latinx immigrants and their families in Oregon through advocacy, coalition building, leadership development, and civic engagement. All right, I come before you today um, to share our concerns about the needs of immigrant Oregonians, many of whom have been disproportionately impacted Uh, by the pandemic and many of whom also have been left out of the federal stimulus relief. To ask the city of Portland to take bold action by supporting the Oregon Worker Relief Fund. The the need for this response is significant. An estimated 27,000 UI and eligible immigrant workers need assistance, all of whom contribute to the collective prosperity of the Portland metro region and are disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. These challenges are compounded by having no access to a wage replacement program, such as federal unemployment insurance. According to a recent Oregon Center for Public Policy report, undocumented immigrants who who contribute to the local tax base but not access benefits are estimated to be at least 27,000 individuals and contribute roughly 19 million annually in state and local taxes. Um, one of every 10 Oregon children live with a family member who is undocumented, and these families need assistance, like all other Oregon families, to get by during this unprecedented crisis, yet they have little to no access to emergency support right now. 
This is why Causa Pecun Latino Network upon all innovation law lab, MRG, and over 100 community partners from across the state have joined efforts and created the Oregon Worker Relief Fund, a proposal for state and local governments to fill the gaps of the UI structure by implementing a statewide system centered in communities, both rural and urban, and, man and managed by Oregon's most trusted culturally specific community-based organizations. We ask the city of Portland to invest in the economic stability of these families through an investment to the Oregon Worker Relief Fund by investing in Oregon's workers left out of the federal stimulus. We ask you to show your full support to our communities to ensure that we're putting the most impacted at the forefront. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate your testimony. And thank you for your patience. That was the last speaker, Mayor. That was it. All right, good. So before I make some brief comments to wrap up, I'd like to give uh, my fellow commissioners an opportunity to close with any remarks that they may have. Colleagues, just raise your hand if you'd like to make final remarks. Uh, Commissioner Hardesty. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, there I am. Thank you, Mayor, um, and thank you to the uh, 50 plus people who testified tonight. Um, I am, uh, like many of you, um, I am not happy that we had to do this budget process in such a abbreviated manner. Um, we um, uh, made a commitment that we wanted the public to be involved, but all of us have been impacted by the pandemic that we are all still experiencing. Um, I heard a lot of information tonight that is consistent with um, information that I've been hearing um, from community members in general. I, I wanna just say for me, as I look at this budget, as I look at the CARES funding, as I look at what we will be able to do with very limited resources, I am, coming to this, uh, thinking about what we're gonna rebuild when this pandemic is over. Um, and my commitment is to build a more equitable community than the one that we had before the pandemic hit. Um, there is desperate need in our community and every single corner of our community. We will not be able to fund it all. And I wanna be really clear about that. We will have to make some really hard choices uh, next week and the week after as we uh, uh, finalize this budget. Um, for me, um, I am looking at what we, what are we building coming out of the pandemic? And for me, um, there are programs within Portland Police Bureau that I hope that we will uh, eliminate. I will think, I, and I'm thinking of programs like the school resource officers, the transit police, uh, the gun violence reduction program, um, and some others. Um, and not because I believe that we can unfund police because we have a constitutional mandate uh, to have police, uh, but because coming out of this pandemic, knowing that we will have limited resources, it is my belief that we will have to go back to core services that the city is required to do. We need more police officers that have the ability to be out on the street. And many of the programs that currently are funded are not programs that allow these officers to respond to calls, to show up in communities, um, to uh, engage in a way that I think we're gonna need coming out of this pandemic. Um, and so it is my hope that the mayor has presented us with a, a bold vision. Uh, but I wanna be really clear, this budget does not address our houseless people uh, who are gonna be significantly impacted. It, it does in some ways, I mean, we're not defunding uh, the, uh, the um, houseless, uh, the Joint Office of Housing Services. But what we know coming out of this pandemic is we're gonna have significant unemployment and we haven't even talked about the people who weren't able to get employed prior to the pandemic. We're anticipating a 30% unemployment rate, which means that that's a white unemployment rate. So for people of color, we're gonna expect around 60% or more. And for youth of color, we're talking about a 95% unemployment rate. 
And so I want to be really clear um, that this budget is just the first step. We're going to come back in the fall and we're going to know more when we do the fall bump process. When we pass this budget, this will be a frame that I hope uh, sets a clear vision about where we're headed when we come out of this pandemic and where we're going to invest our very limited resources. Um, I want us to have legal services for people who have experienced police violence. We don't have that. I want us to be able to have resources for ex-felons and houseless folks. We don't have that. Um, and so we, I, it is my goal coming out of this budget that we are starting the process of building a more just, a more fair, a more equitable city of Portland and our budget should reflect that. And so again, thank you all for coming. Thank you for participating tonight. And uh, thank you for being a part of the solution because uh, we're gonna be in this for years and we're gonna have to be very uh, intentional about how we move through this process. So thank you all. Um, and I look forward to continuing this budget conversation. Thank you, Commissioner Udaley. You had your hand up next. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to thank everyone who took the time to participate tonight. This is not the budget process that any of us imagined. Uh, and I know that the public engagement piece leaves something to be desired. Um, I'm working really hard to establish an online civic engagement platform for the whole city um, so that moving forward, even beyond this crisis, we can better communicate uh, with community members as well as uh, hear your ideas. Um, our systemic failures are on full display and uh, that includes a lot of the shortcomings of our city. So I know we're all looking very carefully at the budget to uh, root out inefficiencies, redundancies, uh, save as much money as we can and, and reprioritize our spending. I wanna thank everyone who has stayed home and helped to flatten the curve. Um, and I just want to reaffirm my commitment to stabilizing people in their homes, whether they are renters or homeowners um, and uh, assure you that we all listened carefully tonight to your concerns. I wanna thank especially the people that testified in support of funding universal defense. Uh, that was slated to be funded uh, in this budget before the crisis and we have found resources in civic life to at least partially fund that program. I'm so heartened to hear uh, about the hundreds of people who have benefited so far from universal defense. And it's um, more important than ever, especially if we can keep people out of those unsafe de detention centers in the midst of this public health crisis. So uh, send your people who didn't get to testify tonight, you can still email all of us. I'm looking forward to hearing from as many people as possible as we move forward with this process. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Udaley. Commissioner Fritz. Thank you, Mayor, and thanks to everybody who testified. Um, I'm just kind of a different perspective. I'm just amazed that this um, budget hearing was, was able to come across. And thanks to Open Signal, thanks to Rick Nixon, thanks to the Council Clerk's Office, um, thank you to Jessica Kennard in the Budget Office. It's phenomenal that um, in two months we've been able to put on or to, to welcome people into a, a virtual um, hearing. Um, and also um, written testimony and uh, people making phone calls are also excellent ways to give council offices input. Uh, I personally learn better by uh, reading people's testimony. So you can count, um, email testimony at portlandoregon.gov. I think that's right. Uh, Carla can correct me if, that's, if it's not right. Um, 
you can call our offices. We're still answering the phones and taking messages. And, um, you know, there, there are many ways to participate. And in some ways, this crisis has made it uh, somewhat easier that people were able to call in instead of um, lining up at City Hall, which isn't particularly equitable either. Um, also, um, thank you to Jessica Kennard in working with the mayor and his staff. Um, I think this is a, 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 a it's it's really incredible that that word is not is used too much, but it's phenomenal how uh, this budget has been put together. And again, it would have been difficult to have done more public engagement because things are literally changing day by day in terms of what funding is available, what's going on with the unions, with where uh, other things. And so I'm I really salute the mayor for putting this together. This is my twelfth budget on the Portland City Council. In the first one in two thousand and nine was right the beginning of the recession and the very first week, we uh, voted on a $500 million stimulus package that Mayor Adams had, had put together. And then there was the first budget from Mayor Hales, where we had to cut $25 million um, and, and asked bureaus for 10% reductions, um, partly because of the library districts and partly because of the houselessness crisis. And so this is... Um, this is one that, that Mayor Wheeler has totally stepped up to the plate to put something on the table that, um, yes, there, may, there will be some discussions between now and when it's adopted, and we certainly want to hear more input from community members. Um, and it, it's remarkable in um, speaking to our values, in trying to keep core services going, and in um, leading the entire council and working together. I've been very pleased with the communication between the offices and um, I look forward to that continuing. Thank you so much. Thank you, Commissioner Fritz. One, one more thing. I, yeah. I, I did also want to thank Mary Lee Bauer and Amanda Hayes, our sign language interpreters, um, for the, it, it, that was also really great to have that service provided tonight. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you, Commissioner Fritz. And I, I also want to extend my gratitude to our ASL interpreters. They did a fantastic job tonight and we appreciate them sticking around a little bit longer. Uh, Carla and Keelan, as always, you in the clerk's office do just magnificent work. And I want to acknowledge that you had to tack very quickly from the type of budget hearing that we're used to having to going to an online platform. And that required you to be nimble and uh, learn some new skills and adapt to new technologies. And I want to appreciate you're doing it very well. Jessica, thank you and your entire team for all the tremendous and long hours you've put into helping me to craft the proposed budget. And I certainly want to thank uh, Kristen Dennis and Sonia Shemansky in my office for their hard work on this uh, over a period of many, many months. Um, I also want to thank Rick and Open Signal for making sure that the platform is here. Uh, and uh, I want to thank everybody who, who, who helped us. I also want to thank everybody who testified tonight. Uh, I want to be clear, I only heard about three different issues discussed tonight. I heard uh, a considerable amount of testimony around policing. I heard a considerable amount of testimony around um, universal representation and uh, underserved communities. And we heard some testimony relating to the auditor's office in particular. And I just want to acknowledge to the public that this does not represent the totality of issues encompassed in this budget, nor does it encompass the totality of perspectives uh, on these items. And uh, while I did not agree with everything I heard tonight, particularly with regard to the police budget, I do respect and appreciate that people took time out of their busy schedules to come and have their perspectives heard on this forum. So thank you all for your patience. Uh, so for those of you who may come across this uh, and say, gee, I wish I had a chance to testify, the good news is you do. Um, if you would like to provide a comment to the city council that you were not able to do so tonight, please go to portlandoregon.gov slash CBO. All of the testimony that you provide in writing will be provided to all of the council offices, and we do read it. This concludes testimony on the city of Portland's budget. This meeting of the budget committee is continued to May 20th, when the budget committee will meet to approve the budget. 
Testimony will be heard at the meeting. This concludes the hearing on the City of Portland's budget. I want to thank you all. We stand adjourned. And good night. <laughs>